Perfect. Please grab your seats. And we'll move on to our land acknowledgement. As we gather, we would like to acknowledge on behalf of Council and our community that we are meeting on the traditional territory of the Algonquin people. We would like to thank the Algonquin people and express our respect and support for their rich history, and we're extremely grateful for their many and continued displays of friendship. We also thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. Next item on the agenda is the adoption of the agenda. And the resolution is that the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region approve the December 6, 2023 agenda. Mover and a seconder, please. Moved by Councillor Tabert, seconded by Councillor Trim. Is there any additions or amendments that need to be made to this agenda? Seeing none, we'll call for a vote. All those in favour? And it's carried. The next uh, item, 3.2, the resolution is that the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region suspend the rules of order to take up the budget public meeting at 5.30 p.m. this evening. A mover and a seconder, please. Moved by Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Moore. And just to remind uh, members of Council and the public is that uh, our procedural bylaw uh, maximizes our meetings at three hours. Yeah, three hours. So um, in order to uh, host the public, the budget public meeting tonight, we have to suspend those rules for today as part of this meeting. Is there any questions or other comments from Council? Seeing none, we'll call for a vote. All those in favour? And it's carried. <coughs> Adoptions of minutes. Two sets of minutes from the 15th and the 22nd of November. The recommendation is that the Council of the Township Whitewater Region approve the regular Council minutes of November 15th and the special Council minutes of November 22nd, 2023. A mover and a seconder, please. <coughs> Councillor Moore and the Deputy Mayor. Any errors or omissions that anybody noted in those two sets of minutes? Um, Councillor Tabert? Do we have to notice that the, that I attended by Zoom or just, it's just regular? Clerk, can you comment on that? No, we just have to show that you have attended. Good. Any other comments or questions with respect to those two sets of minutes? Seeing none, we'll call for a vote. All those in favour? And they're carried. Next item on the agenda is a closed session, minutes from September 20th and 1st of November. The recommendation is that the Council of the Township Whitewater Region approve the closed minutes, closed session minutes of September 20th and November 1st, 2023, understanding that they remain confidential. A mover and a seconder, please. Moved by Councillor Trim, seconded by Councillor Tabert. Is there any comments towards those sets of minutes, understanding that they remain confidential? Good. Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All those in favour? And it's carried. Uh, I note that there are three committees and boards minutes that are attached for your records and your perusal. The first is the Muskrat Watershed Council from the November 16th meeting. The second is the Historical Society's meeting from August 31st. And the last one is a summary of the County Council meetings meeting from November 2023. Is there any additional comments from any of the members that might have that attended those meetings? Good. Seeing none. Next item on the agenda is disclosure of interest. Is there any disclosures for any of the items on tonight's agenda? Good. And I see none. And that brings us to our next item which is presentations. So up next we have the Pembroke Regional Hospital. Mrs. Sabina Mersman and Mr. Scott Combs are going to uh, have a presentation for today's a, a presentation for council today on an initiative that the Pembroke Regional Hospital is putting forth. So, you guys, may, may I interrupt yeah, you want them to you want to maybe make a motion so that they can speak longer than ten minutes. We need a two third. Um... Perfect. Okay. So just before you begin. Um, our procedural bylaw outlines a maximum of 10 minutes for presentations. We know that um, through the preview of this content that it's going to take longer than 10 minutes. So I'd like to get your support to allow them to speak longer than 10 minutes to complete this presentation. 
Okay, we're gonna set a time for 20 minutes. Will that work? Perfect, maximum of 20 minutes. Can I get a mover, please? Moved by Councillor Trim, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. Any comments? And we'll call for a vote. All those in favor? And it's carried, thank you. Yes? Perfect, just before we start then, we'll turn the floor over to Sabina. Thank you very much, uh, Your Worship Mayor Nicholson and uh, Council members. Uh, we are delighted and honored uh, to be able to speak to you and, uh, and on top of that you're extending our time which is uh, really wonderful uh, that we can um, have 20 minutes to present. We would like to talk to you a little bit about the Pembroke Regional Hospital and its impact on uh, um, the residents of Brentford County and uh, and then uh, our next big new initiative on, uh, on a, a large investment that we're making, the magnitude of the investment and uh, perhaps an ask of uh, some assistance. So um, I'm going to start out just briefly to talk about uh, the hospital. So you know we had a acute care hospital, there are uh, four hospitals in, uh, um, in Rhinefu County. Um, we have uh, on top of acute care services, we provide a lot of ambulatory care services, diagnostics and lots of regional programming and I want to focus a bit uh, in my presentation on that today. Uh, we have a, a direct catchment area, which Cobden, Beachburg, Westmeath is part of. When we look at our postal codes and who's coming to the hospital, that's how we say this is direct or, or more uh, regional catchment area uh, of, of about 55,000 residents. And then uh, we provide lots of regional services actually outside of our direct catchment area to Deep River, Berries Bay, uh, Armprey and Renfrew. Uh, and then we have uh, several partnerships as well, um, some uh, with uh, Renfrew Victoria Hospital and the Ottawa Hospital around dialysis services, um, some with the Heart Institute around a cardiac rehab, and some with the Ottawa Hospital Cancer Centre around uh, cancer treatments. Next slide. So in terms of our volume, um, about 5,500 patients stay overnight at the hospital uh, per year. Uh, they generally stay about six or seven days uh, in length. Uh, we have 30,000 emergency department visits, and that's the highest number of emergency department visits in the county. We have, uh, on top of that, 31,000 ambulatory care visits. Uh, so that means people come for blood transfusions or chemotherapy treatments or other diagnostics, um, uh, you know, often cancer diagnostics, but many, many specialists who either come in person from the Ottawa area or uh, have virtual um, visits uh, at the hospital. We uh, have a community mental health program that spans the county. So um, that's an $11 million program uh, on its own that the hospital operates with about 100 staff, providing about 28,000 visits annually. And this is for people with very serious mental health issues, um, uh, about 4,000 of them that we see on a regular basis in a variety of, um, of programs. We deliver 4,500 surgeries. Many of them uh, do stay overnight. So uh, one recent addition, or not that recent, but a few years ago now, is our hip and knee replacement uh, surgery. And we are the only hospital between here and Queensway Carlton Hospital that would uh, provide that. Uh, we are the only birthing center between uh, Queensway Carlton Hospital and North Bay. Uh, and we deliver 800 babies per year. And uh, on the diagnostic imaging front, uh, we have full service uh, DI department with 70,000 exams. 14,000 of them are CT scans and 14 to 15,000 are MRIs. Um, so I want to focus a bit on our uh, regional impact uh, and some things that uh, your uh, citizens are uh, benefiting from as well. So one really proud moment for us was uh, almost two years ago now, the Ministry of Health actually increased our ICU level uh, beds um, to nine. And, uh, and they designated us as a level three ICU, which means we can keep ventilated patients. Again, we're the only hospital in Renfrew County that can do that. We have a dedicated uh, physician 24 seven who's only looking after those nine patients. And uh, of course, there's still people needing to go to ICU in Ottawa if they have uh, highly specialized needs. For, for example, we don't have neurology or we don't have um, you know, plastics and, and a few other uh, specialties, but 
uh, lots of cardiac issues and lung issues we actually keep right, uh, right here in Pembroke. And that was a big step because families, you know, when your loved one is ill, you don't actually want to have to travel to Ottawa for those services. So I talked a little bit about the mental health program already and the community impact we have. Uh, we also have 15 inpatient beds that services the whole county. So a patient uh, who ends up in, in uh, the eMERGE in Barry Bay, in Renfrew or, or Deep River, uh, actually will come to us if they are agreeing to voluntary stay. If they are uh, needing to have an involuntary admission, then they do go to Ottawa. Um, we have a, a large rehabilitation program with 22 beds, and I'll show you on another slide after some data around that, but 80% of people in Renfrew County receive their rehab services here and uh, in, in Pembroke, and 20% uh, still need to go to the Ottawa Hospital for that. Orthopedics, I mentioned already, but not only do we do joint replacements, we are now able to uh, repair hips in Pembroke. That um, also came with the orthopedic program. Before, if you had a hip fracture, you actually had to go to Ottawa. Now you can uh, receive that service in Pembroke, and we have almost um, like over 100 hip fractures now annually that are repaired in Pembroke. Uh, of course, we have the MRI, but then a machine that's actually less known is a nuclear medicine imaging machine. It's a CT scanner that looks specifically at uh, uh, an injection of nuclear isotopes and looks at how blood flows and, uh, and, and um, any other fluids kind of that go through the body. And it's for uh, cancer detection, but also for cardiac imaging. Uh, we are the district stroke center for Renfrew County, so anytime uh, somebody has a stroke in, um, in Renfrew County outside of, we're just, Lockwinock Road I think is the cutoff area, after that they go to Ottawa because it's closer. Um, they are bypassed by any other hospital and come to Pembroke and uh, the stroke patients stay there from their acute stay, ICU stay to rehab. And then we have a couple of other programs, Cardiac Day Hospital. That's actually a program uh, where we have two locations. One of them is in Renfrew, at the Renfrew Hospital, and one of them is in Pembroke. Um, and then our Cardiac Rehab Program. Next slide, please. So this is, I, I think this data is interesting, and I want to demonstrate that we are um, having services uh, far outside of um, our direct catchment area. So on the left-hand side are all the admissions that come from Ottawa Valley OHT patients, and the Ottawa Valley OHT encompasses about a patient population of 80,000 from Deep River to Barry's Bay to just before Ampryor, but does not include Ampryor. Um, so 50% of all acute care admissions in this area come to Pembroke. Then the orange colored hospitals are Renfrew, uh, Barry's Bay and Deep River. Uh, so 20% of patients receive their care there. And then the green colored hospitals are all the Ottawa hospitals. So TOH, uh, the Heart Institute, CHEO and a little bit of Queensway Carlton Hospital. So 30% of our services are still going uh, to, to the Ottawa hospital. And the point that um, um, we are trying to make is that in, con in discussion with the Ottawa Hospital, the investment that we are embarking on will actually allow us to take a few more services back uh, to Pembroke because we have the specialist and we have the equipment and the, and the space, especially in our operating room um, area, uh, to, to have a few more services uh, in Pembroke. So this is something that I think would be of interest to you and your um, citizens as well to have those uh, more services closer to home. We will never be able to do without the Ottawa Hospital, of course. We will never be able to duplicate all of those services. And I want to say we are uh, taking great care in making sure that whatever services we are delivering, we can do so with the same quality and safety that they would be done in Ottawa. There's no point in saying we can do something and not do it with the same quality. So that's always the decision point whereby we are saying, are we going to do enough of that to keep the expertise up or not? And sometimes our hands are forced. So uh, for example, on labor and delivery, um, a few years back, uh, the ministry said, if you don't deliver more than 50 babies, you will not be delivering any babies because you just can't keep the expertise up. So people have to drive a bit more, but it's also a safety, right, uh, a calming thing for mothers. 
the second uh, graph there is on uh, mental health. And as I said before, about 60% of patients who need an inpatient mental health stay come to Pembroke, and the other 40% go to Ottawa. This is also something we're working on. We are going to try to become what's called a Schedule One facility where people can stay against uh, their wishes and have higher acuity treatment. Again, if you're in a big crisis, to have family around is so important. So we, we really want to try to, uh, to offer that service to our residents here. And then uh, the third graph is on our rehab program. 80% of patients in Renfrew County receive their rehab services in Pembroke and 20% in Ottawa. Next slide, please. Um, we are also a very large employer in the region, and uh, many of our employees live in uh, the Beechburg, Cobden, Westmeath area. Uh, we have almost 1,000 employees now, um, with, I think Scott said last night, a payroll of about $60 million. Uh, um, we have over 200 physicians, uh, 80, 70 to 80 of them are there on a daily basis. Uh, then we have some people who come a week at a time and then go and work somewhere else for a week. And then we have some courtesy staff who uh, only provide some clinics, clinic, ambulatory clinics, visits and such. And uh, we have many learners uh, on a daily basis, not only physician learners and nursing learners, but we have people in diagnostic imaging and respiratory therapy in allied health who join us for the learning experience. And uh, Scott and I are sharing the presentation, so I'm going to hand it over to him for a few slides now. Thanks, Sabina. We can hear me OK. You can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so we'll spend, uh, and I'm, I am cognizant of your time, so I'll try and get through these, but the balance of our presentation will be around uh, a very big uh, project uh, coming up for us in a very large investment, uh, and that's a new hospital information system. I'm just going to get a little bit closer. Um, so I've just put on this slide uh, what is a hospital information system. Uh, it's a comprehensive integrated information system designed to manage pretty much all um, aspects of a hospital's operation, such as medical, administrative, financial, uh, certainly on the clinical side and throughout. Um, this really isn't just a new piece of software. It will change most processes and be a fundamental change for our, our, our staff, uh, physicians, and the experience of our patients. So um, it is a very big change. Next slide, please. Why, why now for, for, for Pembroke Regional Hospital? Um, well, we're a bit, we are a bit behind. Uh, PRH is one of the last hospitals in the province to move to um, an approved EMR vendor. EMR stands for electronic medical record. It, it, it gets used interchangeably by some folks uh, with, uh, with the HIS or hospital information system. Uh, the province has uh, said that any new implementation has to be one of three companies or vendors. Uh, we are not currently, um, uh, we do not have a fully functional HIS, but our current IT system is not on one, one of the three, and we are one of the last ones to move. Um, our, our current system really is reliant on paper-based processes. Um, we are, uh, by many accounts, paper-based, and um, we believe it exposes um, our staff our pa and our patients to several risks. And Sabina will touch on some of the benefits that come with a new hospital information system around patient safety um, and some of the data that um, they've seen in hospitals that have, have implemented uh, the system that we're looking to implement. Uh, our current vendor on, on our IT system is, is by most accounts uh, leaving the Canadian or provincial Ontario market. So that, you know, that obviously exposes us to, to many risks should they pull completely out of the, the market. Um, we believe that any future improvements and growth of services, some of the things that Sabina, I think, was mentioning, um, really requires a fully functional HIS system. And then last but not least, um, we've heard this uh, multiple times, but that our recruiting around physician and, and professional staff um, is challenged in our current environment by not having a fully functional uh, HIS. Um, it's, it's another barrier for having physicians to come who are used to working in these environments. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Or no? No? I'm not hearing oh, sorry. I'll get, I'll get closer. Is that? Okay, my apologies. No, that's probably too loud. <laughs> Okay. Um, 
So just, just that, that's fine to move to the next slide, but we, um, we, we have heard um, you know, f physicians coming uh, to Pembroke Regional Hospital, if they're gonna have to learn a new process, a new system, um, they don't often wanna do that. They're, they're used to working in an environment um, where they have a fully integrated HIS. So we, we do believe that uh, implementing the system will greatly uh, improve our ability to attract physicians. Next slide, please, thanks. Um, so, so this is specifically what we're looking to implement. It's a, it's a new system called EPIC. Um, and this slide is a little bit busy, but what we're trying to show, we are uh, joining the Ottawa Hospital and the organization that they've named the Atlas Alliance, which is um, a group of uh, uh, organizations. If you look down the right uh, hand side, we've listed them out. Um, and really um, our patient flow of, of patients that come to Pembroke Regional Hospital, um, if they're not coming to see us, if they're getting referred to another physician or they're going to another hospital in the region, they are very likely to be going to another hospital that has an EPIC um, system already in place. So that interconnectability of having the same patient record available at any of these hospitals is very powerful. And, and again, Sabina will speak to some of the benefits, but um, this has really pointed us um, in the direction of Epic. The one good thing or one benefit f uh, of us being a little bit late is that we've, se we've been able to see where all the, the region has gone. And that's very directly pointed us to, uh, to Epic being the most impactful for us to implement. Thanks. Great, thank you. There's an advantage of being short today. That's good. <laughs> uh, can you have the next slide, please? Yes. So I don't want to go through every bullet point, but I think um, you have all seen uh, the application, or a lot of you, called MyChart. We hear every day that people love it, uh, and MyChart is something that the Ottawa Hospital has, Renfrew Victoria Hospital as well, and that's the system we would be joining. So all of the information, whether it comes from Pembroke, from Ottawa, from Renfrew, Deep River, Barry's Bay, would all be on the same record. And that's a powerful tool, not only for patients, but uh, for physicians as well. So it'll improve communication, it'll improve communication and involvement of patients and families, and um, overall um, will reduce some adverse um, incidents as well. The Ottawa Hospital told us in the first year of implementation, their medication errors dropped by 65% with the implementation of this new system. So it's, it's uh, significant. Next slide, please. On the provider experience, so we're talking uh, physicians, nurses, everyone, it's one patient, one chart. We had the, uh, the great uh, opportunity to have the CEO of the Ottawa Hospital talk at our last board meeting, and he was saying how powerful that is for physicians. It doesn't matter where they go. He said, you know, they basically just park their car in a different parking lot, but they can now do surgery in Kempville, uh, will be in the future in Pembroke, in Hawkesbury, in, um, in other areas. And uh, basically, we'll see the exact same record. We'll have the same processes on how to order diagnostics, how to order lab work. So it makes the whole uh, process so much easier. Also, of course, going back uh, away from a, from a paper-based system, um, you know, there's this uh, th uh, thing called physician handwriting. But um, um, it's not only physicians. You know, we all have uh, handwriting issues and deciphering those. That's what often leads to errors. And so going away from that is, uh, is fantastic. And that communication between providers. We hear, for example, from, from my chart, patients are saying the information is earlier in their own my chart than it is on a physician's, um, on a physician's computer. So it's powerful. Next slide, please. On health outcomes, uh, you know, when you talk about preventative care and the improvements that it has there, think about instead of uh, for a physician looking back in the chart to say, when was Sabina's last uh, cancer screening? It'll pop up in front of them to say, it has been two years since Sabina had her mammogram, you know, she's going to have to go back. Um, so the preventative care and staying on top of that is, uh, is so much better with an electronic system. And that's for, for you know, on all fronts. Um, the interface with medication systems, uh, with uh, diagnostic tools is incredible. And of course, seeing patient progress at every step, whether, you, whether the physician is at home, whether they are inside, whether it's a nurse or allied health staff, they all see the same information all at the same time. Next slide, please. 
And then value and efficiency, of course, uh, all of us know that reducing manual processes, once you get over that initial learning hump, which you know I still have right now on Microsoft 365, but uh, you know I'll get there, and, and then all of a sudden the system becomes so much more effective. <clears throat> the other point that uh, you may have experienced, and this and others, is we see that diagnostic tests are being repeated. So you know you get a test done in Pembroke, and you go to the Ottawa hospital, and they say, well, I can't find the test in Epic. It wouldn't be in Epic. It's in a different electronic system, but it's more cumbersome to open you know another screen and put another password in. Um, so they're like, oh, it's easier for you to go down to the lab and get that blood work drawn again. So it'll reduce definitely duplication in, in diagnostic testing. And then all of those other things around waste, um, uh, waste that I put on the slide. But the big thing too is we will have access to all the best practices now that are always developed at the Ottawa Hospital. They are our guidepost for us. They have all the experts there. They have the research institute um, connected to them, and they always are on top of you know what's the new order set for heart failure. You know what do we need to do for cancer of the bladder or whatever, and uh, and so this will automatically now be available. Um, uh, to, uh, to everyone at the hospital. So I think we are heading to the finance slide and I'm going to head that over to Scott again because he is much better at talking about money than I am. Thank you. And just a couple, just a couple last slides of our presentation just around the financial impact. So I just include some numbers on this slide. Um, it, it is a very uh, big investment with hopefully uh, you've seen you know, lots of benefits, but it comes with a large price tag. So uh, our current estimate is that this will be a $17 million one-time um, initial cost to implement it. Um, and you know lots of different things in that 17 million uh, equipment licensing uh, and, and a very significant amount of costs involved with the change management and training of our staff given um, this this will be a very big change in, in processes so lo lots of time and resources around that change to support it uh, incremental um, after the one-time cost this will increase our operating costs annually uh, mainly because of licensing, but some other costs of 1.5 million annually, uh, and um, you know we've we've uh, put into our model that we will we, we will have to uh, to take a loan or debt to pay for this investment, uh, and uh, at our assumptions this would uh, require us to pay 7.6 million dollars of interest costs spread over 15 years, which would be the the amortization period of the debt. Next slide, please. So how you know how are hospitals funding this this investment? We're certainly not the only ones. Uh, uh, we're not uh, you know uh, we've we've spoken to many hospitals going through this. Um, the Ministry of Health does not provide specific funding uh, for, for these investments. So similar to medical equipment or certain infrastructure projects, it is the hospital. Um, there's no specific extra funding to to do these these investments. It's really left to the hospital. Um, so uh, many hospitals, uh, you know, PRH included, uh, have to finance it through a bank loan. Some hospitals do have reserve resources to offset some of the costs to be able to pay for it. Uh, Pembroke does not. We're not in that situation. Um, hospital foundation. So we, um, uh, our hospital foundation, uh, has and will commit. Uh, to, to doing their best to help offset some of the costs and we've certainly heard that from other other medium-sized hospital regional hospitals like us that, that that their foundations have been able to do to do that in their communities uh, and then lastly you know part of our outreach that we're here today uh, is that we do know um, other you know other hospitals similar to us when they're doing these investments have gone uh, to the kind of surrounding municipalities um, to look for support um, and you know that's that's, that's why we're here today. Uh, that's the end of our presentation. We appreciate uh, your time and uh, sorry if we went over a little bit over time, but happy to take any questions. No, that's perfect. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, lots of interesting facts that may not come up normally on what the hospital, what the hospital provides and to whom. And uh, so at this point, we'll open it up to the floor Members of council, is there any questions or comments that you want to make? 
with respect to today's presentation? Councillor Trim. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, that was a very uh, informative and uh, hopeful uh, presentation, uh, especially the my chart piece. Uh, I know myself personally, I've been directed away from uh, Pembroke uh, because of because the the Ottawa hospitals would prefer me to go to uh, a hospital they could connect directly quickly with. And so living in Westmeath, it was not much further to go to Renfrew. And, um, uh, and that's where I was directed to on, on a number of occasions. And, uh, and I suspect it was because of the hospital information system that you're, you're um, describing today. And so this is, this is really good news. Uh, and um, also, I, I have experienced uh, uh, um, repeat uh, diagnostic testing, uh, which is a waste of time and money. Uh, uh, so uh, th this is a uh, really good news, and it would, I'm sure it would be better news if you could find the $17 million quickly. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, Councillor Olmsted. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Um, I didn't realize there was that many employees and physicians uh, in Pembroke. That, that's very impressive. Um, with respect to the financing, um, just wondering how do how do banks treat hospitals? Is, are you guys like a, do they treat you like a like a for profit company, or how like how do you guys go and ask for money uh, with a payback to the banks? I'm, I'm just looking at the interest cost over 15 years, which is um, very high versus what we would see in a township, you know, where there's um, some long term. Um, lower interest rates that we have access to but just wondering how, how do you get, how does the banks treat you guys yeah hopefully you can hear me okay um i think we're a preferred um i mean i think we're seen as being supported by the provincial government so i think we do get um we do get you know preferential rates or rate to line with uh, the government um you know the interest cost is really a function of a pretty big amount that even at um, preferred rates, we've, we've probably been a little bit conservative than what we've assumed for an interest rate, but I don't think too far off is that there's still, uh, for long term, it's, it's in, the, you know, in the ballpark of 5%. Um, when we do go to actually finalize our financing, there are some other options other than the charter bank. So there's uh, some, uh, you may have heard of, uh, you know, infra infrastructure uh, bank, uh, there's Ontario, uh, the, the OFA, the Ontario Financial Authority. Um, so we would be, um, we don't have it secured, um, but we'd be looking to see what's the best best option. Thanks so much. That's good. Any other questions? Yeah, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, again, great presentation. Thank you very much. I just have one question. You had mentioned uh, you're one of the last uh, hospitals that are offering this and I'm just wondering if you know when the expectation is that Pembroke will be up to uh, and, and using this uh, system. Thank you. So um, we are working with the Ottawa Hospital on those timelines and uh, they have just moved uh, deeper than Kempville about a year ago. So they're telling us the whole uh, change management process will take an entire year and we are starting in the spring, uh, spring next year. Any other questions? Good. I, I have a couple. <laughs> Good. Um, you're, you, you've already done some presentations to other municipalities. I know Petawawa, Pembroke, those are the two so far, and county. Can you describe how they went or if there's any discussion points that we haven't heard tonight that might have come up in those meetings? Um, there were um, definitely we were extremely well received uh, at uh, all of them, the county, Petawawa and Pembroke. I think there's a great uh, sense that uh, people appreciate the hospital and the services that we provide to the entire county as well. We are also still going to uh, Laurentian Valley. So we have kind of targeted our direct catchment area and the county. Um, I think um, 
uh, in, in general, um, everybody is in agreement this needs to be done and would like to try to support us. But if you're asking specifically whether anybody um, said, I'm going to give you a million dollars, no. Um, I, I really hope uh, that uh, you can see uh, the need and collectively, perhaps, as municipalities to come together to see what could be done uh, for us. I, I know this is a big ask, and I know there are many people uh, coming to ask, but uh, we have uh, clearly heard. So John Yakabaski is an extremely uh, high supporter of the hospital. I meet him with him regularly. He actually went to bat for us uh, at the <coughs> ministry level. He met directly with the Minister of Health. Um, and, and ask her specifically about Pembroke and the HIS system. And her response was hospitals in the past had, have had to pay it and hospitals for the future have, um, have to pay it uh, on their own. So, uh, but you know, we are not giving up the, the fight at every level because as you can see, a, a debt of that magnitude will have operational impacts for us for the future. And the, as much as we can avoid that, um, that's, that's our road forward. Does that answer your question? Yeah. No, and that's perfect. And I think uh, advocacy is clearly one of the avenues that we would want to consider. Uh, I won't put words into the balance of, of council's mouth, but uh, something that we can discuss as we go along. Um, the other question I had is just, can you describe the difference between your classification as a medium hospital versus some of the other hospitals that are in our community that might provide supports to our residents? Yes, absolutely. So Ontario classif puts hospitals into four uh, categories, uh, teaching hospitals like the Ottawa Hospital and then large community hospitals that would be Queensway, Carlton and Morfor that have like 80,000 eMERGE uh, visits and such. And then um, the medium-sized hospitals, which would be us, uh, Cornwall, uh, really the only two in the Champlain Health region, but then it's Brockville, Belleville, um, Northumberland Hills, Ross Memorial in Lindsay. Um, and the role of those hospitals is really to provide high, higher specialized services um, while the, uh, the large city is a little bit further away. So we are that step in between. The challenge for those hospitals is, and I, you know, I've, um, I'm going to repeat it again. Some people who have heard it two or three times now, forgive me, but it's a little bit like the Costco versus your local grocery store. So Costco can have very um, reduced prices on things because they buy in bulk, and uh, the, the local grocery stores can do that. So for a medium-sized hospital, at every step of the way when we provide specialized services, they come at a higher price tag whether we have to incentivize physicians in a different way or we can't make the math work on some of our surgeries. So the more you do of one thing, sometimes you know it, that has some financial benefits. So the medium-sized hospitals in Ontario all have more financial trouble than the rest of the hospitals in the province. And the ministry is recognizing that. We actually have a, a special uh, subcommittee. But, um, you know, nevertheless, um, we seem to be getting 1% of uh, increases versus uh, small and, and other hospitals getting 2 and 3%. So we are suffering a bit financially in comparison uh, to others, I would say. Thank you. There's no other questions. I'll just say thank you so much for taking the time to come out and present to Council. You've given us a whole bunch to think about. And uh, I think it will add to the collective understanding of what the Pembroke Regional Hospital does and this project specifically. So I think that's a very valuable. And I also just want to thank you for everything that you and the staff do at the Pembroke Regional Hospital to bring this kind of service, this care, closer to home. Which, as you said a number of times in your presentation, it's better when you can be closer to your loved ones when they're in a hospital. So we appreciate everything you do. So thank you. Great, thank you so much and Merry Christmas. Yes, Merry Christmas. Excellent, we'll move on to our next agenda item, which is a public meeting. <clears throat> yeah, I go straight to the script.
Good. So the next part of the agenda, just to remind those here and those that might be watching, is we will kind of, we're not kind of, we're going to pause our regular council meeting and move into a public meeting specific to some zoning amendments. So I would like to open and call this public meeting to order at 1.42 p.m. And it's to hear comments and receive information from the public regarding proposed applications to amend the Township of Whitewater Region's zoning bylaw in accordance with the Planning Act. Good. And I will ask everyone in attendance to respect the decorum of council and refrain from behavior intended to disrupt this important portion of today's meeting. Next, I'd ask Planner Benzie to kindly provide us with some important information pertaining to the public meeting process. Okay, thank you, Mayor Nicholson. So before I read uh, the appeal rights, ooh, this is a little echoey. <laughs> Is that, oh, that sounds better, I think. Does that sound better for everybody else? Okay, <laughs> hearing my own self looping. Um, so before I read the, uh, the standard appeal rights, I do have a special announcement behind me, or I guess actually behind our, our treasurer, Curtis, is uh, the newest member of our community development team, Rebecca Gill. So Rebecca Gill is our new community development coordinator. That means uh, she wears multiple hats here at the township. She's helping with planning applications, with building permit applications, with economic development projects, and on communications. So I think given all that, um, many of our community members will probably have the opportunity and pleasure to meet Rebecca in the near future. And the staff here are super happy to have her on board. So formally welcome, Rebecca. And uh, with that, I'll do the more uh, legalese uh, language here. So if any person or public body does not make an oral submission at the public meeting or make written submissions to the Township of Whitewater Region before the bylaw is passed, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of Council of the Township of Whitewater Region to the Ontario Land Tribunal. The person or public body may not be added as a party to the hearing of an appeal before the tribunal unless, in the opinion of the tribunal, there are reasonable grounds to do so. Section 3419 of the Planning Act states that not later than 20 days after giving of notice of passing of the bylaw, the applicant, any person or public body who made an oral submission at the public meeting or made a written submission to council before the bylaw was passed or the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing may appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal by filing an appeal with the clerk of the municipality. So with that, we do have um, four applications um, to discuss today. And the first one, we're gonna start out with a fairly straightforward one. This is zoning bylaw amendment file number D14194 and it's on uh, Marjorie Road. And this application uh, was submitted by Derek Smith for the property described as Ross Con Concession 4 West, uh, part of lot six and seven, uh, known as 462 Marjorie Road. And the application has been submitted as a condition of consent, which had file number D10293. So the subject property is 26 hectares in size. It has 800 meters of frontage on Foresters Falls Road and 285 meters on frontage of Mar on Marjorie Road. Um, the lands are being used for agricultural purposes. Um, so this bylaw amendment is a result of a surplus dwelling severance in the agricultural designation and the PPS and the official plan require that uh, the retained lands in these situations are rezoned to prohibit residential uses and that's what this amendment will do is, uh, is prohibit residential uses on the retained lands. The uh, severed and retained parcels meet all other elements of the bylaw um, and no other comments or concerns have been received from, from the public or public agencies. Um, so with that, staff are recommending that um, this bylaw is approved um, as we are doing this uh, to make sure that the um, PPS and OP get implemented. And with that, I'll conclude my presentation on this item. Thank you, Planner Benzi. I'll just confirm first uh, through staff, is there anyone online that has indicated they want to make a comment to this application? I have nobody online. Good. And is there any member of the public that would like to make any comment with respect to this application? Good. Seeing none, 
And last, is there any questions or comments from members of council with respect to this application? Understanding that we will formally vote on it subsequently later in the agenda. Good. Excellent. Seeing no comments, we'll move on to the second application, please. Okay, thank you, Mayor Nicholson. So this is uh, zoning bylaw amendment file number D14191. It's on Nangor Trail. And this application has been submitted by Don Matthews on behalf of uh, numbered company 16866743 Ontario Limited uh, for the lands described as part of lots eight and nine Westmeath concession A CLF. Um, and it's on Nangor Trail. So this application is has also been submitted in part as a condition of consent for applications D10199, D10200, and D10201. And these uh, consents were given conditional approval by the Committee of Adjustment on January 20th of 2023. And the locations of the, of the lots as well as the retained lands are, are shown there on the screen on that key map. So the lands are irregular in shape and they uh, contain bush cover and are presently uh, completely vacant. So the proposal here is that the applicant is seeking an amendment to the Westmeath zoning bylaw to change the entire zoning, so the severed and retained, from tourism commercial zone to the rural zone. So this change is a required condition for the severed lands uh, in these applications noted above in order to permit a residential use on the lands. And the applicant also has no intention of using the retained lands for a resort or tourism commercial development. So uh, the request has been to uh, rezone those lands as well to rural. So the lands are primarily designated rural in the County of Renfrew official plan. There is a portion towards the north end of the retained parcel that is waterfront. And both of these designations permit low density residential development as well as rural related uh, commercial and recreational development. Uh, the official plan does encourage the continued use of tourism commercial uses uh, near the Ottawa River. The severed lands in these applications and the retained lands, or sorry, the severed lands in the applications, they're zoned right now tourism commercial, and the retained lands contain some lands that are zoned tourism commercial as well as a portion uh, that's environmental protection. And the environmental protection area is in the north end of the property in and around um, a low-lying marshy wetland area. So the tourism commercial zone permits a variety of, of tourism related uses. Uh, and in this zone, residential uses are only permitted accessory to an existing uh, commercial uh, operation. So in order to permit uh, a house on, on those severed lands, um, the application is aiming to rezone them to, to rural, which does permit a single dwelling as a primary use. And as I mentioned, the property owner does not int intend to use the retained lands for tourism or resort development. Uh, it's my understanding that these lands had been zoned tourism commercial quite some time ago when the uh, Nangor Trail, Nangor Trail, sorry, Nangor Resort um, was, uh, was first established and it's no longer being used as a resort anymore. So um, that the applicant has um, recognize this and has asked to uh, change the whole lands to, to rural and any future development on the retained lands would be required to meet um, the official plan and provisions of that rural zone and the EP portion of the lands are not uh, to be changed through this amendment. So just um, some final comments. Uh, the proposal uh, staff field does not contravene the, the policy set out in the PPS or the OP. Uh, rural uses here can, will continue to um, respect the character of the area. And although the official plan does um, encourage the continued use of, of commercial properties, particularly when they're waterfront pr properties, given that um, this is it's more of a back lot, it's not on the waterfront, and um, the uh, Nangor Resort is no longer there, all the um, development there has, has now converted to, uh, to residential. Uh, there's no foreseen impact on that. And um, it's almost, this can be considered um, going to a, a more sensitive land use. So the impacts on, on neighboring properties, when it, if it were to be developed in the future as a, uh, for residential development, 
um, that type of development can have less of an impact than an actual resort. So uh, staff don't feel that there would be any impacts on, on neighboring property uses at this time, or there would be less impacts than a, than a resort. Um, and just to reiterate, any future development on the land will need to meet the requirements and the policies for the land division policies of the official plan, as well as the provisions of, of the rural and EP zones. Um, we did have a couple neighbors reach out just with questions on the proposal, but uh, we did not re receive any um, formal comments or concerns from the public or public agencies on this proposal. And uh, I'll stop uh, there with that. Thank you. Thank you, Planner Benzi. Uh, Confirmer, is there anyone virtually who has indicated they'd like to make a comment on this application? There is nobody, thank you. Good, is there anyone in the public here today that would like to make comment on this application? Good, is there any member of council that would like to ask a question or make a comment with respect to this application? Yes, Councillor Tavert. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, if I, when I look at this, I see there's a huge parcel that isn't being developed. So, uh, and I know we can't assume things, but is this going to be uh, like a subdivision, only three at a time, so that it won't go through a subdivision? Like we're going to have a whole whack of homes going up there without, I, I, I'm not into all this planning, but I see this and I'm getting nervous that this is going to be three here and then three more and then three more and, and, and it's all going not to be, I don't know, together or something. Do you know what I'm getting out here? I'm just worried that it's going to be piecemeal, I guess. And is that allowed? I don't know. Good, good question. We'll turn it over to Planner Benzie. Sure, thank you. Through you. So any, right now we aren't aware of any future development on that land. Um, but if it were to be proposed, it would have to meet the land division policies of the official plan. So the land division policies allow three to be created from the holding, and basically that whole holding is, is the yellow and the red together. Um, an, an additional two are permitted through consent, but there's, there's conditions that it would have to meet, including that all of those three existing ones are developed, and those, those two final ones would need to close out the holding. So if it was intended to build more than two lots, they would have to go through the plan of subdivision process. To, yeah, I'll stop there. Saying that this is one severance, there, this, the severances that were approved back in January this year, it was three. So they've got their three when the official plan permits three. There's an additional two that are permitted provided certain conditions are met. The main ones being that all three of those have a house on it and that those final two would, would close out the development of potential of that holding. So the, app, the landowner would have to decide if they want to create two more parcels there big ones, or to go through and develop it through the plan of subdivision process. Okay, and see that makes me more nervous because if he develops or she develops that into two severances, then those severances can have five, oh. No. Okay, okay, thank you. Good. Do you wanna just amplify that response? <laughs> Yes, so um, when we look at severance history, we look at how many parcels have been severed in total from that holding and what that holding looks like in 1971. So right now, everything south of Nangor Trail is, is one, Nangor Trail is one parcel and they've created three from that. So only two more in total could be created through the consent process. Anything beyond that would likely need to go to a plan of subdivision. So even if it was cut in half, you can't just, through consent, create a bunch of more, that would all contribute to the total. And I just would remind, there are provisions in our, in the official plan that we have, I can't remember, appendix or annexes, that speak to how you could go about with a rural subdivision in a situation like this. So there are mechanisms to do it by consent, three plus two, but there are also mechanisms that exist within our portion of our annex that support rural subdivisions for use of property like that. So there are mechanisms that exist already and the planner would be making sure that we follow those processes as outlined. Good? Thank you. Good. Any other questions or comments from members of council? Yes, Councillor Trim. Uh, just, just to note, if I'm correct, uh, 
uh, Planner Benzie, that the, uh, the if, even though this is named Nangor Trail, it is a municipal uh, maintained road. Uh, and so these severances are on a municipal road, not on a private road, which is, um, uh, which is another benefit. Uh, uh, the township at, at the moment provides services on this road. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good. And just a trigger on that. I know traditionally, and I'm looking at the manager of public works, traditionally we've had trails representing private roads and municipal roads are named in another way. Do we have a provision that changes names once private roads become adopted as municipal roads? We do not. The County of Renfrew um, has a best practice for um, road uh, suffix. So you're correct in trails, um, lanes, etc., are typically uh, private roads, um, but, but we do not have a, a mechanism to change it. If some of the council would want to, um, and, and the county use it as a, uh, a general general reference, um, but, but but I believe back when the the 911 um, uh, naming convention came in, um, that that was looked at, and, and I believe some of these um, old names w uh, uh, um, stayed with the actual road. Thank you. And Planner Benzie. Yeah, I'll just add a little bit. Nowadays, if there was an existing private road and we were to assume it, the, the bylaw that's typically passed is an assumption and renaming. So now for future ones, we'll, we'll typically rename, rename it. We, we look at considerations and consult with the county on that. Um, but as, um, as our public work manager said, this sometimes in the past, it hasn't always happened. Yes, Councillor Trim. Just a quick comment. We recently did that with Zach Road, which was formerly, um, no, it was Morgan Trail. That's right, thank you. And so that's something we just recently did, and so I guess that's what we'll do in the future. Good, thank you. Any other comments or questions from members of council? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to the third application, please. Okay, thank you. So this is for zoning bylaw file number D14192, and it's at uh, lot 19 Ross concession two. So this application has been submitted by Alan Trisick on behalf of Lola Macy's uh, for the lands as I just described. And this is another application submitted as a condition of consent for a lot addition, file number D10208. And it applies to both the severed and retained lands in that application. And this application was conditionally approved by committee um, in July of this year. And the purpose of that consent application, the lot addition, is to enlarge an existing waterfront property on Jeffreys Lake. And you can see that in the applicant's sketch just on the um, next, uh, next slide there, Sean. Yeah, okay. Um, so the retained and severed lands in the application uh, are vacant and the lands to be added to contain a dwelling and a shed and no, de no new development or changes of use have been proposed um, at the time of this amendment or at the time of the consent application. Uh, a right-of-way traverses the lands. In some parts it's known as Ashbury Trail and others uh, Gilchrist Way and this right-of-way provides access to several water several waterfront lots and also gives access uh, to the retained lands as well. So the proposal here is, um, is two amendments to the Ross zoning bylaw and these changes have both been uh, requested um, by, by staff at the time of the um, conditions uh, for the consent application. So first uh, to rezone the uh, rural portions of the land to limited service residential. And this is essentially a technical matter be to recognize that um, there's only private roads here and whenever you have um, properties with, with private roads, they should be limited service residential because the limited service is not serviced by a public road. So it's just cleaning that up, making sure that um, the enlarged parcel there only has um, one consistent zone because otherwise it would be split zoned rural and, and limited service residential. 
Uh, but this, the second thing is to put a holding on the retained lands to prohibit residential development until a supportive mineral aggregate impact has been submitted to the satisfaction of the township. So the, in terms of policies, um, the lands contain four land use de designations of the official plan. The majority of the property is mineral aggregate and that's where this holding um, essentially comes from. Uh, there are areas, however, around the lake that are designated waterfront and some environmental protections and, and then some areas that are rural. So the mineral aggregate, aggregate designation means that the, the primary use of the land is to be for the development of a pit or a quarry. Um, the waterfront and rural designations permit low density residential development and development and site alteration is not permitted in the environmental protection areas. So in order to implement the, the PPS, which requires that we do preserve land for mineral aggregate resources, um, the, there's a policy in the official plan that requires that whenever development of a new sensitive use is proposed within 300 meters of an area designated mineral aggregate that a mineral aggregate impact assessment be prepared that shows how the development is not going to impact the future ability to um, extract mineral aggregate resources on this site. So the lands, um, similar, they have multiple uh, designations. They also are also split zoned, rural, extractive industrial reserve and environmental protection. Um, the waterfront property benefiting from the lot addition is, is limited service residential, LSR, and the severed lands are zoned rural. So as I mentioned, to ensure that uh, the enlarged property is just one zone, uh, this amendment has been requested to, to rezone the whole thing LSR. Similarly, as the retained parcel, some of it is zoned rural. Um, this application would change that rural zone to, to LSR as well. And then uh, the main second thing here is that because residential uses are permitted in the rural zone um, and at the time of the consent application, no new development was proposed. So we didn't require the mineral aggregate assessment to happen at the lot addition. Uh, the condition of the severance was that the that portion of the property of the retained lands get put in a holding so that when the applicant or the owner, pardon me, does want to build a property, they have to do that, that study that shows um, that it would be okay. Uh, and that's what the, uh, the holding is, is, is there to do. So just bringing that all together, um, because the official plan sets out separation distances and influence er areas from mineral aggregate reserves before development is permitted within 300 meters of these areas, the study needs to be done to demonstrate support. Um, and because the applicant did not um, suggest that at the time. Um, we're suggesting this as a holding. It was not done at the consent. Um, so the rezoning will enable the applicant to proceed with the lot addition and in the future, if and when the property owner of the retained parcel wishes to construct a dwelling, they'll be required to uh, remove the holding and removing that holding will mean that they submit that study. Um, no other concerns have been raised, oh, pardon me, we have not received any concerns uh, from members of the public or members of public agencies. I did receive a few calls just asking for questions. Um, as expressed, it is a little bit complicated to explain. So some members of the neighbors were just wanting more information on what exactly was being proposed. And once I uh, explained it, they had no final uh, comments or concerns that they wanted to raise formally. And with that, I will uh, conclude that presentation and happy to, uh, to answer questions. Perfect. Clerk, if you can confirm, is there anyone on virtual that would like to make comment on this application? We have nobody on. Perfect. And any member of the public that would like to make comment on this application? Good. Seeing none. Well, members of council, any member of council that wants to make comment? Question. Councillor Olmsted. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, so just to confirm, the applicant is okay to, to put the holding symbol on now and in the future remove it if necessary? They're, they're aware of this? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so it, it was that also was a condition of the consent, and it was discussed at the time of the consent application too. Okay. Thank you. Good, Councillor Moore. Just one query. I'm wondering: Is that the end of Gilchrist Way, and will this addition block uh, trailer roadway? 
That's a good question through you, Mayor Nicholson. So the it is a private road, Gilchrist Way. So the portion that so right now it's it, the retained land contains all of the right of way. When the um, lawyers essentially create that lot addition, the that right of way will that portion of the right of way will transfer from the retained lands to the enlarged lands, but everybody who has access to that part, they'll still maintain their access. They'll just be accessing um, Alan Troisick's property as opposed to the retained lands. So no one is going to lose access to the road. They just, rather than travel over the retained lands, they're now gonna be traveling over the enlarged lands, but we make sure that access rights are, are maintained. Great, thank you. Any other questions from members of council? Okay, seeing none, on to the fourth application, please. Last but not least. So this is zoning bylaw amendment application D14193, and it's at 1051 Dupuy Line. So this application has been submitted by Ellen Wright for the property uh, known as 1051 Dupuy Line, described as part of Westmeath concession to CLF, um, part lot six with the um, R plan number that's there in the report. So the, the property is, is currently vacant, it's tree covered. It has an area of 0 0.8 hectares and a frontage of six, 76 meters. And the property is surrounded by residential uses to the north and other bush lot and agricultural uses to the south, east and the west. So the applicant is proposing an amendment to section 19.1A of the Westmeath bylaw to allow for the construction of an accessory building, in this case a private garage, to be built on the property prior to the construction of the primary residential use. And for reference, the zoning bylaw defines private garage as an enclosed or partially enclosed structure in which no business, occupation, or service is conducted for profit, and which structure is used primarily for the storage of one or more vehicles and storage of household equipment incidental to the residential occupancy. So the applicant's private garage is proposed to be built uh, at the back end of the property um, and meeting all setbacks requirements of the accessory building, the other accessory building provisions that are in section 3.3 of the bylaw. So the, the lands are designated agriculture in the County of Renfrew official plan and it's the intent of that agriculture designation to preserve prime agricultural areas. However, there is a policy uh, in the agricultural policies of the OP that recognizes that there are small scattered um, non-agricultural residential properties scattered throughout uh, the county as well as in the, the township. And typically these represent areas that were, lands that were severed, um, but for the lands were designated agriculture. And the pro this subject property is, is one of them. It was created through consent in 2021. At the time, the property was in a, a non-decision area uh, assigned by the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and um, the underlying rural designation was applied, which is why it was able to be, to be severed. Uh, so the official plan does have a policy that allows councils to recognize non-agricultural uses on these existing small holdings uh, in, in the local zoning bylaw. So the property right now is, is zoned rural in the Westmeath bylaw, and an accessory building is not permitted as a primary use, and therefore not permitted to be built before the primary use. And on a lot of this size, the only primary use that would be permitted is a single detached dwelling. So this, present, this application, if approved, would place the land in an exception zone to modify that provision and permit the construction of an accessory building prior to the construction of a dwelling. All other provisions of the Westmeath zoning bylaw will apply, and to ensure that the private garage is not used for commercial purposes and not used for residential purposes, um, staff are also recommending that um, the bylaw uh, explicitly prohibit commercial use or residential use, and that's similar to the approach that we've taken in the past in these situations. Uh, just one last thing, uh, we did receive a phone call and during a, a site visit um, that our that staff 
um, did at the site, we did become aware that there were some steel wheels stored on the property. Um, and we did have a discussion with the applicant that this was in contravention to the open storage components of the bylaw. And um, the uh, applicant was aware of it and noted that they would be um, removed. So um, once that was um, relayed to the, the neighboring property owner, they had no other further questions and no further comments or concerns had been received um, by uh, other neighbors or public agencies. Um, so just, I guess, to, to wrap that up, um, the, this proposed amendment, their um, staff feel that it does not uh, contravene the, the PPS or the OP. The PPS supports development that is characteristics of a rural lifestyle and is compatible with the local context. In this situation, the proposed garage is being, um, the location of the garage, pardon me, is uh, proposed at the uh, back of the property, which will allow um, a dwelling in the future, uh, space enough for it to be built closer to the road as um, with, you know, similar to the other properties in the area. Um, and then just lastly, the official plan recognizes these, these unique situations where we have small agricultural designated lots, um, and it does give us the ability to provide exceptions for these situations in the zoning bylaw such as this. And with that, uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Planner Benzie. Just to confirm again, because you, you didn't conclude with it, any comments in writing that were received on this application? No comments in writing. Perfect. And is there anyone on virtual that would like to make a comment? I have nobody on, on Zoom. Perfect. And any members of the public that would like to make comment on this application? Good. Seeing none, we'll turn to Council. Is there any members of Council? Councillor Trim. Uh, yes, through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Plan Planner Benzi. Um, how much time does the applicant have to build the uh, main use um, structure, which is a detached residential building? Uh, at this point, there is no, no time limit. So what is being requested through this zoning bylaw is to allow the construction uh, of a of a garage before there is a plan for the construction of a house. Any other questions? Yes, Councillor Tabard. I spoke to um, Planner Benzie about this, but I, I have a concern that there's going to be more garages than there are going to be homes because this is like another one that we're approving. Um, I, I, and I know that we can't stop it from happening, but how can we how, how can we agree to have so many garages and have no homes? Where are these people going to live eventually? I think I'm going to take that as a comment. Or did you have a question? No, it's a question. I mean, okay. why why are we approving garages when we should be approving homes so that they can have a garage? Because otherwise, we're going to have people living in garages. Correct. Okay. So. I'm just going to reword it a little bit. You can correct me if I'm wrong. But why is this type of um, application considered by councils? Can you explain, Planner Benzie? Why would we, why would, why do we consider a, a, a garage as an example before the primary residence? So perhaps just to um, reframe that, um, why would it be? Why would a planner recommend supporting it? So that we have to make sure that every decision that we recommend, certainly it's, it's uh, council that approves it. Um, there, there aren't specific policies in the PPS or the official plan that say no garages before a house. Uh, we do have to consider the character of the area. Um, and I think the, the one in this situation, there is the fact that the garage is going to be towards the back of the property where there is trees um, and it is going to be meeting all the other setbacks. So setbacks are typically in place to reduce, um, you know, impacts on, on neighboring property owners. In this case, there, there are fields around. So um, staff do not foresee an impact to the, the character of the neighboring area. Um, in conversations that I've had with community members, there are folks in rural areas who 
sometimes want to have um, a lot where the garage is built first and they don't have the intention of building a house just yet and um, we do consider some some flexibility there recognizing that a garage is still considered partly a, a residential a residential use um, and the so the bylaw doesn't allow by right the garage to be built first um, but you know whenever somebody does want to want to do this um, you know they, they have to come and and make this like a similar argument so in the absence of really strict policies that say no garages before house we have to you know we we see that this is it's still considerate considered a residential use um, and there's there's nothing no teeth that would say why this would why we would recommend not allowing it um, I think uh, yeah I think I'm, hopefully that that helps I feel like I had a, a third thing to say and, and it might come back to me but if there's any other if you'd like additional context or, or questions um, happy to happy to expand on that too Nothing further, thank you. Councilor Olmsted. Um, maybe I can add a little bit to it. Um, being in the industry and having gone through a similar situation recently personally, I can tell you it's a huge advantage to putting up a, a, a building such as this, from what I anticipate, um, prior to the build um, for a number of reasons. Weather reasons, so uh, you have contractors um, bring in material and tools and that kind of stuff in. Um, so just from a, a weather or a, um, a safety area, it, it's a huge advantage to have, rather than bringing sea cans and stuff into a property and um, you know, some temporary stuff. Um, also for, uh, for theft reasons, um, the building materials are through the roof in terms of cost now. Um, so when you're, you're building a house, sometimes it's taking up to a year to go through the build of a house. So it, it's a real advantage to have a structure uh, on site where you can, store, um, uh, you can store some of these very expensive materials. Not to mention that um, materials sometimes are taking anywhere from you know, two weeks to eight months to come in. So um, a lot of people are, are having to take materials uh, a lot earlier than they actually need the materials. So materials could be sitting on site for six or seven months before they're actually used. So it really helps to, uh, you talk doors and windows and siding and that kind of stuff. So it helps to have a place to store all that stuff while the actual um, dwelling is being built. So um, I'm not against putting up structures like this as long as there's a plan down the road to, uh, to go ahead and, and uh, build a residential dwelling. Thank you. Councilor Tavert. Um, with regards to Councilor Olmstead, though, but there's no plan to build. There's no timeline. So, I mean, that can sit with a garage for umpteen years with no build on it. So, how many of these are we going to allow? I mean, we have a bylaw that says you have to build the house first and then the garage, but now we're building. I mean, I know this is the second one in as many months that we were approving the garage without a timeline for a home to be built. I understand, I agree with what you're saying that they, they should have or they would need the garage for for safety alone and weather, but if there's no timeline, I mean, I, we ha yeah, there's no timeline here and that's my concern. Yeah, and, and noted. Good, and I'll just add, you had talked about use of that secondary, that, that, that garage and other uses. Um, there are other mechanisms that the corporation, the township has to enforce how that property is used, um, like by law enforcement as an example, rather than specifically using our zoning provisions. But Councillor Benzie, or sorry, Councillor Benzie, <laughs> Planner Benzie. <laughs> Slip. I remember the, the final thing, I, my, um, I had lost my earlier train of thought, but you had asked too about, about the use of the property and, and not ensuring it wasn't being used for, for a dwelling, because that, that is a concern that I recognize people have is that the garages are a shortcut to a, to a house and that there's going to be residential uses there and concerns about whether or not the, the building is going to be built in a way that would accommodate a dwelling. But the, so the bylaw itself, we would recommend that, um, and it's how it's been drafted to explicitly say residential use is prohibited 
commercial garage, commercial uses prohibited. So that is one way to reduce the um, concern of, of the garage being used in a, for a residential purpose. Good, Councillor Trim. Uh, yes, and uh, Mr. Mayor, since you have appointed me lead for planning, I have come to learn um, that uh, the provincial policy statement uh, allows municipalities to, to make some restrictions with respect to uh, private property. But these are meant to be very narrow and um, uh, very strict. We just can't, uh, pe pe people have certain rights to their private property and we have to recognize that. And uh, this is something that I've come to learn and uh, uh, Planner Benzi has helped me understand that. And so I, I appreciate uh, that uh, the concerns would be that, that have been raised. However, um, people have a right to do some development on their private property if it's within the provincial policy uh, statement. And so I, I've, I will be supporting this application. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Any other comments, questions from Council? Good, seeing none, that concludes our four applications. And uh, it's important for us to have this public meeting to receive and acknowledge uh, public input, whether it had been in person, virtually, in writing, or through members of council for discussion today. So I appreciate everybody for bringing forth their input and, uh, and that will conclude our public meeting. So we will call the public meeting adjourned at 2.23 p.m. Now, I'm gonna seek councils, just because I know we have a couple members of the public that are sitting here waiting for our final decision on these applications. If I can get council's concurrence to, to skip forward to item number 10 on the agenda, a deal with these four applications and then we'll take a short recess and the members of the public who aren't interested in staying for the rest of the meeting can, can vacate. Now, do I need a formal vote, clerk? Or? We probably need to suspend the, uh, suspend the, what are we doing here? Procedural bylaw on the agenda. You wanna take up, what do you wanna do? Cause we need to do the reports first and then we have to do the bylaws. So there's still two. So there's still, you go through the, you still have to go through the reports and then after the reports you have to pass the bylaws. So I don't know, um, there's discussion during both. So well, I think we'll just do this part. The reports, Yeah. okay. So you should suspend the rules so that you can take up item 10 before all the other ones. 10.1 to 10.4, perfect. Okay, can I get a mover to suspend the rules to allow us to take items 10.1 to 10.4 at this point in time. Moved by Councillor Olmsted, seconded by Councillor Moore. And I'll call for a vote. All those in favor? And it's carried. Good, Clerk? Yep. Okay, so we'll go straight into item 10.1. And the uh, recommendation before us, this is specific to Major Marjorie Road. The recommendation is that the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region approve an amendment to the zoning category of the property described at Ross Concession 4W, parts, part lots 6 and 7. Say it again for me. Marjorie. Marjorie Road to the Agriculture Exception 25, AE 25 zone to prohibit residential uses on the property. A mover and a seconder, please. Moved by Councillor Trim, seconded by Councillor Olmsted. Planner Benzie. Is there uh, no we, further comments? <laughs> <laughs> Good. So we'll just acknowledge that the summation of the report was provided as part of the public meeting. There's no need to repeat it, but we acknowledge that it has already occurred. Council's already received it. Fair. Is there any discussion, questions, or comments from members of council on this recommendation? Good. Seeing for none, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor? And it's carried. Item 10.2, this is Nangor Trails application. The recommendation is that the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region approve an amendment to the zoning category of the property described as part of lots eight and nine, concession, Westmeath Concession ACLF 
from tourism, commercial, to rural. A mover and a seconder, please. Moved by Councillor Olmsted, seconded by Deputy Mayor. Planner Benzi, any additional comments? No, but because I, I don't think I said it for any of the public meetings, but I will just say that staff are in favor of, uh, or do recommend council supporting this recommendation. Good, thank you. And I will acknowledge for the members of the public, this uh, report was already presented as par part of our public meeting. Um, so council has received this report and had an opportunity. Is there any additional questions or comments that members of council would like to make with respect to this resolution? Good, seeing none, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor? And it's carried. Next item is 10.3. This is uh, zoning bylaw amendment for Ross concession. The recommendation that the Council of the Township Whitewater Region approve two amendments of the property described at part of lot 19, Ross concession 2, Ashbury Trail. First item, to rezone the rural portion of the property to limited service residential. And second item, to place a, a holding symbol on the retained lands in consent application D10-208 that requires the complete completion of a supportive mineral aggregate impact assessment to permit residential uses. A mover and a seconder, please. Moved by Councillor Trim, seconded by Councillor Moore. Any additional comments, Planner Benzi? No other than staff do support uh, this recommendation. Thank you. Good, and I'll just reiterate once more that we receive this report as part of the public meeting. Uh, so council has already had an opportunity to acknowledge that. Is there any additional comments or questions from members of council on this resolution? Good, seeing none, call for a vote. All those in favor? It's carried. Next item 10.4, which is a zoning amendment for Dupuy Line. Recommendation that the Council of the Township Whitewater Region approve a modification to the zoning category for the property described as Westmeath Concession 2 CLF, part lot 6, and known municipally as 1051 Westmeath Road, from rural to rural exception 34. It's, can we... Sorry, just an amendment to this resolution. Sorry. Yes, yes, please. It, instead of Westmeath, can we call it Dupuy? Sorry. Good, okay. So just for members of council and the public, I'm going to reread this recommendation. It is amended from what has been produced in the, the agenda. So the recommendation is that the council of the Township Whitewater Region approve a modification to the zoning category for the property described as Westmeath Concession 2 CLF part lot six and known municipally as 1051 Dupuy Road from rural to rural exception 34. A mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Trim, Councillor Tabbert. <clears throat> Planner Benzi, any additional comments? No additional comments, just staff support the, uh, the rezoning here, thank you. Good, and again, uh, we received this report as part of the public meeting, uh, and Council had an opportunity to, to ask questions at that time. You now have another opportunity to ask questions to this resolution. Is there any comments, questions from members of Council? Good, seeing none, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor? And it's carried. Good, and with that, we will stop for a brief rest, recess to allow any members of the public that wish to transition and uh, a bio break. So it's 2.30 right now. Um, we'll call for about 10 minutes, so please be seated by 2.40.
Welcome back to the regular council meeting for December 6th. Uh, it, we will call ourselves back to order at 2.41 p.m. And we'll go back to item number eight on the agenda, which is the mayor's address. And I have some prepared words. So the first one, uh, first I want to recognize that today is the National Day to End Violence Against Women. And you'll note that there was an event being hosted in Petawawa at the Women's Monument that we unfortunately were unable to have representation at simply because of this meeting. But you will note that the members of council and staff present today are wearing a white ribbon as part of the White Ribbon Pledge. It is an international campaign aimed at raising awareness about ending violence against women. By wearing a white ribbon, individuals pledge to never commit, condone, or remain silent about violence against women. The campaign encourages people to take an active role in promoting gender equality, raising awareness, and taking action to prevent violence. So thank you for wearing your white ribbon today. Since our last regular council meeting on November 15th, I attended 18 events. It was a very full couple of weeks and meetings on behalf of council related to township business and another six meetings on behalf of county council relating to um, county business. And I'm just gonna highlight a couple of those events. The first one, I was invited into both Beechburg and Cobden Public Schools to speak to grades, a grade four, five class and a grade five class about local government. And there were so many great questions on a number of topics and believe it or not, I don't even know if it was the theme, but landfills was one thing that we spoke a lot about. So it was interesting. The kids were very interested in not just all the aspects of municipal government, but landfills kept coming up. It's also great to see how much interest we have in municipal government and how it works and who's responsible for what. And they did provide some gifts that I received on behalf of council. So uh, a nice mug from Cobden District Public School and some thank you cards uh, oh, that I received. Yeah. Um, so two thank you cards, but then a number of autographs that I've received <laughs> from behalf of the kids. Oh, I, I told them I would make sure that that was presented back to council and you could see that they were very excited about what we do and it was very interested. Um, I encourage them both, both classes to reach out to the clerk and if they would like to come and attend a council meeting or come and just see what the council chambers are like and do a mock meeting. I think that's something that we could facilitate easily. So um, if they are interested, they'll come through the clerk. But if, if any of you have contacts in the schools, I think it's a great way for them to, to understand how municipal government works and to also put a little scope in there of potential future staff employment opportunities right here in their community. Good, uh, another event that I did attend was the Eganville and District Senior Active Living Fair, where I was asked to help kick off the fair with some comments about our age-friendly community plan. Very popular, and you're seeing a lot of other communities want to adopt an age-friendly community plan. And our efforts to help support our seniors to age in our community. Uh, nice to see all the resources that were available to our community at this fair and Eganville's efforts to bring those services out into the forefront for the seniors in, their, uh, in the immediate vicinity. And I believe we'll see ConnectWell hosting a similar event here in Whitewater this spring. So it'll be an opportunity if members of council wanna pop in and just see what kind of opportunities exist for seniors from all levels of government and not-for-profits. So it's an excellent opportunity to, to see that in, in action. One of the other meetings that I attended over the past two weeks was a meeting with the mayors Reeves of Madawaska Valley, Renfrew and Deep River. We unfortunately share a common challenge as these communities also have water and wastewater rates currently on average or soon to be as high or higher than ours. As an example, Deep River just, uh, just approved a plan to double their rates over the next seven years. Although these other communities are metered, uh, the average costs are very comparable and similar challenges that they're also having. 
So we reached out and had a meeting together with their CAOs to better understand what was driving their cost increases and what steps they were taking to address it. Uh, of course, lots of information, lots of details that we can take away, but they also agreed to share their information to add extra weight to our advocacy efforts. So if we are successful in getting our delegation to Roma, we could have up to other four mayors in the room all representing the same interest. So some, some additional weight there, very valuable. And the, uh, the warden is one of those. He's also the Reeve of, of Renfrew, so he's also very interested in the issue. So I just remind council and members of the public that we are going to continue to advocate and reach out to any community in similar situation to us. And you'll note later in the agenda that we have a notice of motion resolution that will hopefully also assist us in our continued efforts specifically with the county. And tonight, a uh, very big night tonight, tonight is an opportunity for us to receive and recognize public input into the draft 2024 budget. And just as a reminder, we did provide staff with direction back in October. We wanted them to work within a limit of a 1% increase in the operating budget, a 4.2% increase in the capital budget, and to find every savings possible for water and wastewater budgets. So s staff will be presenting the budget proposal, which was refined through our last two meetings, November 1st and November 22nd. So staff will be presenting that back to us and the public tonight. With that, uh, we'll carry on with our meeting today. Thank you, and that ends my address. Good. The next item is item number nine, which is public comments. And I know I confirm with the clerk, is there anybody registered to make public comment or provided them in writing? We have none received. Good, none received. So item 10, and I'll just note that items 10.1 through 10.4, we had moved up earlier in the agenda through uh, concurrence with council. So we will jump straight into item 10.5, which is our community safety and well-being plan. The recommendation before us is that the council of the Township of Whitewater Region adopt the joint community safety and well-being plan for Upper Ottawa Valley, which is attached to this report. A mover and a seconder, please. Moved by Councillor Tavert, seconded by Councillor Trim. And staff lead is our clerk on this agenda item, so clerk. Thank you. Uh, so as you know, in 2018, the local government, or sorry, the Ontario government passed legislation requiring that every municipality develops a community safety and well-being plan. Um, we have been working with the City of Pembroke, Town of Petawawa, Town of Laurentian Hills, and uh, the Townships of Laurentian Valley, Head Clara and Mariah, North Algona, Wilberforce, and portions of Admas and Bromley on uh, a joint community safety and well-being plan as Upper Ottawa um, Valley uh, OPP, or sorry, the Police Department, um, look after our, our area. Uh, so finally, we are happy to report that our community safe safety and well-being plan is finalized and we are ready for final approval. Uh, the plan um, identifies uh, key initiatives, the function of the advisory committee and key risk factors identified for uh, priority future action and next steps and planning process. Uh, the plan does have um, three levels of engagement, which is the elevator pitch, which is a quick short read, the dentist office read, which is has a bit more greater um, uh, detail, and the deep dive, which is uh, an actual look of data initiatives and um, identifies future priorities. Uh, uh, the plan was circulated to the councils and partnering municipalities for adoption. I believe the other municipalities already have adopted it. Uh, so um, financial implications is um, uh, we received a grant for the consultant to prepare this plan. So at this time, there is no financial implications. And once approved, that we'll send it to um, Mr. Flanagan, Finnegan, sorry, Mr. Finnegan, who has uh, created this document for us and we'll let him know that uh, the resolution was approved. Thank you, Clerk. And I'll go to my mover first. Councillor Tavard, any comments or questions? Uh, yes, I came in near the end of this uh, community plan, so I'm not 
100% familiar with it, but I've gone through some of it. And um, I, I'm recommending we pass it, but I'm hoping to meet with the um, sergeants, uh, the liaisons from um, the Upper Ottawa Valley Det Detachment and Renfrew because we are part of both. And, uh, and I'll uh, meet with, uh, hopefully talk with Mr. Finnegan as well so I can become more familiar with this plan. Thank you. Good, and Councillor Trim, you're the seconder. Any comments? No. Any other comments or questions from members of council? That's good. I think it's a, I think it's important, Councillor Tabard. Like you said, once we know what the next steps are, how do we implement the plan locally within the municipality and with our partners, understanding that we all share the same resources that support our residents for community safety and well-being. So. Um, once we know more, you can bring it back to council with the clerk. That's good. Seeing no other questions, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor? It's carried. Good. Next item, 10.6, uh, Cameron Street, Earl Street, Vera Street Rehab debenture. So the recommendation is that the council of the Township Whitewater Region approve a debenture for bylaw for the road and water infrastructure rehabilitation of Cameron Street, Earl Street, and Vera Crescent. A mover and a seconder, please. Moved by Councillor Moore. Seconded by Councillor Trim. This is going to the Treasurer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so this debenture uh, closes out a infrastructure loan that we took out uh, back in June 2022. Uh, that was passed by Council uh, Bylaw 2206-1515. Um, the original uh, um, infrastructure loan was for $2.5 million. Uh, we took draws of that over the time while the construction pro uh, process was go ongoing. Uh, that has now substantially been completed, so now we are able to switch this over to the uh, debenture and lock in our rate uh, and set payments. Um, so what we're looking at the f is a 10-year term. Uh, so the first payment will occur in 2024, June 2024. Uh, it has been incorporated, I should note, in the 2024 budget as uh, been presented. Um, the final payment will be made in uh, December 15th, 2023. Uh, whenever this debenture is finalized, uh, the total uh, principal remaining that the township will owe on will be $14,751,494,000. Um, that will be at the end of 2023. Um, the financial implications of this are that the interest rate for the term will be 4.51%. Um, Again, it's a $2.5 million loan over 10 years. Uh, the annual payments will be $313,359.90. For the total carrying costs for this debenture over the 10 years, it'll be $633,598.95. Um, so bring it to a $3.1 million cost for the overall project. Um, and both the principal and interest payments have been included in the budget. Uh, every year we have to look at our uh, annual repayment limit uh, which is the amount of debenture cost uh, we can take on that we're able to make payments back to, um, which is 25% of our allowable um, revenue. So there is a chart uh, on the graph or on the uh, report. It goes through and talks about uh, st uh, for, the, for the full of 2024 uh, at the start of the year, we'll have principal and interest totaling $1.581 million dollars uh, our total revenue, which was based on the 2022 FIR, was uh, 13 million. We remove all uh, excluded amounts, which is grants and deferred revenue and, and um, uh, uh, Canada grants. So our net revenues is $10 million. 25% uh, is 2.52. Uh, our current debt, the 1.51, leaves us with $948,000 of calculated uh, more debt payments that we could take on which means we could take on other debt and that's the amount that we have from payments. Um, to predict an actual amount of debt that we could take on is different in the fact that it depends on the term of the actual loan. You take on a shorter term loan, the payments are higher, so you don't go as far with as much money as you're able to borrow for. You go with a longer term loan, the payments are smaller, so you can have more of those those amounts owing. Uh, that's the, the one thing to note with that uh, estimated annual repayment limit. Um, so the bylaw itself is attached at the end of the agenda. Um, it, it dictates everything that came from Infrastructure Ontario to pr pr proceed with this uh, to the next phase. Thank you. 
Thank you, Treasurer. Any questions or comments from members of Council? Good. I'm just going to relate this back to the presentation from Pembroke Regional Hospital, where he was assuming a 5% rate for 15 years, and we're securing 4.51 for 10. I'm looking, Councillor Olmstead is nodding, so that makes sense. Okay. Our money bags. Okay, good. <clears throat> Any other comments or questions from members of council? Councilor Olmsted. Yeah, just, just one regarding the ARL. Um, and it certainly looks like we have room to maneuver. But my experience with banks and government is they love you borrowing money. Um, they offer lots of it. Um, so I, I'd caution us not to, I think we're in a pretty decent spot. I think you'd agree. Um, we're in a good spot now, but um, there's, uh, and it looks like there's room, there's lots of room to, to, to move down the road, but I, I think I'd like to continue operating in the range that we're in now, where we're, we're nowhere near that upper limit. Thank you. Good. No other comments or questions from members of council? I'll call for a vote. All those in favor? And it's carried. Thank you, Treasurer. Pretty easy to spend that much money. Okay, next item, 10.7, Moxham Road Culvert Replacement. So the recommendation that the Council of the Township Waywater Region direct staff to fund the culvert replacement on Moxham Road in 2023 from the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund, the OCIF Reserve. Mover and a seconder, please. Move by Councillor Moore, second by Councillor Olmsted. Manager of Public Works. Yeah, thank you. If you, if you recall back on switch. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, if you recall, Council, uh, back on June 21st, um, um, the DCA was authorized to, uh, for, for delegated authority to purchase a culvert, um, um, not exceeding $30,000. Um, this is a, a a uh, good news project that, that uh, municipal staff um, changed the culverts and they and they and they upgraded Moxham Road at the same time, um, which the total cost came in, <coughs> sorry, uh, just over twenty uh, twenty two thousand um, dollars, and that was not including labor or or, or uh, trucking costs. Um, where the cost savings that. Um, that occurred that staff used uh, grindings and tailings from our um, our winter stand operations that um, that aren't uh, um, accounted for. Um, so, so this project does um, is is being re uh, recommended uh, to be funded by by the o OCIF uh, reserve, um, as the, the the three projects that were in the 2023 budget were under budget by by 95,000. Um, which would leave just uh, over uh, eighty-one thousand to be uh, uh, to to be left in the reserve for uh, for uh, future years. Thank you. Good. Just to clarify, so uh, funding that twenty-two thousand dollars in actual costs, not including labor or trucking, to be funded from the surplus on our OCF projects in twenty twenty-three. Yeah, that's correct. Perfect. Thank you. Any questions or comments? I'll turn to Councillor Moore first as the mover. Uh, just a kudos to our Public Works Department for, I know um, some of the residents who uh, have property along there were quite concerned about not having access, but we, were, we managed to, to do it quickly and get it under budget once the culvert finally came in. So kudos to the staff for a job well done. Excellent. We'll echo that from Council. Thank you. And Councillor Olmsted, you're the seconder. Any comments, questions? No. Just uh, reiterate what the Councillor Moore said. Thank you. Good. Any other members? Councillor Tabbert. Oh, yeah, sorry. Further to those, um, along with fixing the culvert, you also fixed the main road there. And, and uh, it was horrible to walk on before, but for uh, the people who use it to walk, their dogs and things, it's wonderful now. There's no fear of breaking a leg or something on those big rocks and stones. Thanks. 
Good. No other questions. I just also I use it as an example to the other members of council. This is an example of of something that wasn't in our business plan or our, our budget for 2023. And this is how things that come up need to be considered. And uh, it still doesn't remove the responsibility from council to find the money. In this case, uh, members of, uh, of staff were able to secure it using surpluses. Um, had they not, this 22,000 would have been a commitment that we would have had to fund in our 2024 budget. So understanding in your decisions like that, there is a risk that we're borrowing from our future year, but necessary and, uh, and, and something that worked out very well for us in our community this, this year. Okay, with that being said, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Good, uh, next item is notice of motions, number 11. And, and clerk, just confirm, I present the notice of motion first before I ask for new ones? Uh, yeah, your res because your resolutions are at the back of it, right? Oh, do you want to present? I'm sorry, I didn't yeah. follow your... Uh... Do I present this one first or ask for them uh, first? Do you want to ask for them first, maybe? Okay. Good, so we'll just go around. Is there anybody that would like to put a notice of motion forward, members of council? Good, seeing none. No notices motion. Now, clerk, I can present the one that we have. And this, just to confirm, my agenda is an old agenda, but do you all have a copy of this in front of you? We may not. No. I'll, I'll forward them the right source. I could print the version real quick here. And I'll if we could, it's, just, it's going to be long. <clears throat> it's on the board. Now. It's on yeah. You should have it on your agenda, not the one I printed. Sorry. It's on, it's on. You have it online? Does anybody need it printed by the CAO before we start? It's okay if you do. You're good? Okay. Safe CAO. Excellent. So I'm going to present this, and I'm going, it means I'm going to read it. Uh, because it is so important to our residents, I want to highlight what we're presenting to County Council. And part of it is, if there are changes you want to make in it, this is your opportunity as members of Council to... Um, amend it as you see fit once it's put on the table. Good, so it's rural and small urban municipalities. Whereas, the provincial policy statement, the PPS, states that the municipal sewage services and municipal water services are the preferred form of servicing for settlement areas to support protection of the environment and minimize potential risks to human health and safety, and that intensification and redevelopment within these settlement areas should be promoted. And Whereas the PPS states that planning authorities should protect, shall protect, improve, or restore the quality of water, quality and quantity of water by implementing the necessary restrictions on development and site alteration to protect all drinking supplies and designated vulnerable areas to, and protect, improve, or restore vulnerable surface and groundwater, sensitive surface water features, and sensitive groundwater features and their hydro, hydrologic functions. And whereas the PPS states that there is consideration of environmental lake capacity as well as stormwater management practices. And whereas the Ministry of the Environment Protection and Conservation Procedural Guideline B-1-5 Policy 2 provision states that water quality which presently does not meet the provincial water quality objectives shall not be further degraded and all practical measures shall be undertaken to upgrade the water quality to the objectives, whereas in 2014, the township authorized JP2G Consultants Incorporated to undertake a municipal class environmental assessment for the purpose of evaluating viable options to upgrade the 1979 Cobden waste treatment, wastewater treatment plant. The plant did not meet guidelines for effluent flow into Muskrat Lake and Cobden wetland being highly sensitive at capacity in inland lake and provincially significant wetlands and acknowledged as one of the most eutrophic lakes in the province. The plant had ongoing seasonal overflow events and was at maximum capacity. And whereas in 2018, the Council of the Township Whitewater Region approved the construction of a new parallel mechanical system that would meet all provincial environmental and regulatory requirements, including accommodating future growth. Federal and provincial contributions only covered 50% 
of the final construction costs as there was no ability to renegotiate with federal and provincial partners once real costs were known. As a result, the balance of costs, $6 million, was debentured over 30 years at interest rates that are slightly punitive to rural and small urban municipalities. And whereas in 2019, the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region conducted a water and wastewater rate study that demonstrated the need for rate increases of over 100% to fund the new wastewater treatment plant construction debenture and the significantly increased operating costs for a parallel mechanical system. Rural and small urban municipalities experience very limited growth as federal and provincial policies heavily support growth in urban centres. And as there are no other sources of available operational funding, rural and small urban municipalities are expected to fund the construction and operation of these state-of-the-art systems from existing property owners and nominally forecasted growth. And whereas in 2023, the Township of Whitewater Region combined water and wastewater rates have risen to almost $3,000 a year for its 511 users and are amongst the highest in County of Renfrew and across the province of Ontario. Whereas on October 18th, 2023, Whitewater Region Council passed a motion to advocate to our MP and MPP to seek delegations with provincial and federal ministries to make them aware that rural and small urban water and wastewater systems are financially unsustainable and need additional supports from all levels of government to keep rural communities affordable. So now, therefore, be it resolved that the Council of the Township Whitewater Region, one, advocates to the County of Renfrew to make County Council aware that rural and small urban water and wastewater systems are financially unsustainable and seek a resolution to support advocacy for additional financial supports from the federal and provincial and federal levels of government, and to seek support from the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, the Rural Ontario Municipalities Association, and the Federation of Canadian Municipalities to examine if the unaffordability of water and wastewater system operation, operational costs is systemic provincially and nationally, two, to establish a water and wastewater task force that would report to Council with advice and policy recommendations related to the operating and life cycle costs of water and wastewater systems, including a review of existing programs, policies, and solutions both locally and in the relevant jurisdictions. And three, that this resolution be circulated to the Honourable Cheryl Glant, MP, John Yakabuski, MPP, AMO, Roma, FCM, all municipalities within the County of Renfrew, County of Renfrew Warden and the City of Pembroke. And the resolution motion before us is moved by myself. Is there a seconder? Councillor Trim. Good. We'll move into discussion. Is there any discussion, comments, questions from members of Council? Councillor Olmsted. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, obviously, a lot of thought put into this. Um, and I fully support and endorse the recommendation. The um, one area that I'd like to maybe um, add to is um, I recall at the beginning of every council term, each of us has to sign a, a letter stating we're personally held liable to this, the water quality, uh, standard quality. And um, so it's, it, in reading, reading that and rereading it, it's almost a threat that you're going to be personally held liable to uphold the standard water quality within your, within your region. So just under uh, section one, two, three, four, uh, where you state whereas the, Minis the Ministry of Environment Protection and Conservation um, in that section, I, I would like something added to that where um, it states that you know, we're, uh, I think you went through, uh, just let me reread that. It might have been the one before the one after it. States of water quality, which presently does not meet the provincial water quality objectives, so not be further degraded. Well, in rereading that uh, letter that we had to sign um, back at the beginning of, of our term, it states that if, if you do not meet the provincial water quality objectives, you're personally held liable. Um, so I, I'd like 
to push back to say that you know we're we, we've been railroaded into something here where we've been threatened that if we don't uphold the water quality standards that we're going to be personally held liable so they've got you over a couple of barrels here um, so I, I'd, I'd like some addendum in uh, in that uh, paragraph please I don't I don't exactly know how I how to verbalize it or to, to to script it but I'd like something put in there about you're, you're personally holding municipal councillors responsible and liable for water quality Perfect. So I'm going to take that as a. I can see he wants to jump in. I'm going to take that as a proposed amendment to the resolution or the, the motion. Sorry, it's a motion. Um, I need a seconder, and then we can go through. Yes, seconded by Councillor Tabert, and staff. Just to make sure we word it correctly, can you propose some specific language? Maybe another paragraph. I would just say that what uh, Councillor Holmes says referring to is with respect to the Safe Drinking mm -hmm. Water Act, which is adopted by the province, and within it. It stipulates that, um, if you'll allow me just one quick second here, that uh, every owner, being in this case the corporation of the Township of Whitewater Region, of a municipal drinking water system um, or, a reg or a regulated non-municipal drinking water system, and if an operating authority is responsible for the operation, the operating authority for the system shall ensure, and is a variety of things. So uh, perhaps um, if I go back to the motion, it was item three you referred to, if you don't mind me asking. So the uh, four, whereas the Ministry of the Environment, Protection and Conservation procedural guidelines you're referring to? Mm -hmm. yeah. If I may, so um, that's what I'm referring to, but may, maybe it's another section there um, stating that the safe, uh, what, what's the? Um, the Ontario the, Drinking Water Act. Right, so may, maybe it's addendum uh, in, on its own to say that um, whereas Local municipalities are responsible for the Safe Drinking Act. Um, we are personally held liable. If I could offer to our clerk maybe to draft something, uh, and then we could uh, we could put it together shortly, if you will. And I'm not sure if we recess for two minutes while she drafts it, and then we can come back, perhaps. Or we any thoughts, uh, Clerk Miller? If you want to just add that part, I'm wondering if we can just do an amendment to add wording for um, the Safe Water Drinking Act, and I can do a whereas mm -hmm. and add that section to the the, res uh, the motion. Good. So what we can do then, um, in principle, what will we have is, and I'll just make it clear is that we're going to insert a fifth whereas. The whereas, if the clerk can draft something that speaks specifically to the uh, legal responsibilities that council members of council, on behalf of the corporation, have as dictated through the Safe Drinking Water Act, what we'll do is we'll take a two-minute recess to allow that that gets properly uh, inputted with staff's input, and then we'll reconvene. So we'll take a recess here at 3:14 and come back in two or three minutes. Thank you.
welcome back. Uh, we just, just for the viewers that may have seen the interruption, we just paused for a few minutes to get some very specific wording for a proposed amendment to the resolution that's before us specific to water and wastewater rates. And I'm just gonna have the clerk read the, and just, if you're looking at this online, it is, we're inserting a fifth paragraph. So between the existing fourth and fifth whereases, we're inserting a new whereas. We'll get it read in, and then we'll look to the mover and the seconder to make sure that that represents what you'd like to have proposed as your amendment. So clerk. Okay. Whereas the statutory standard of care, section 19 of the Safe Drinking Water Act of 2002 expressly extends legal responsibility to people with decision-making authority over municipal drinking water systems. It requires that they exercise the level of care, diligence, and skill with regard to a municipal drinking water system that a reasonable, prudent person would be expected to exercise in a similar situation. It is also expected that they can exercise this due diligence honestly, competently, and with integrity. Thank you, Clerk. Mover? Yeah, I think that captures it. Thank you. Good. Seconder? Yes. Good. Any other comments from members of council on the proposed amendment, which is the insertion of the paragraph just read by the clerk? None? Okay, so we are voting just on the proposed amendment. All those in favor? It's carried. Good. Uh, Councilor Olmstead, you had the floor to start. Do you have any other comments that you want to make with respect to the motion? Uh, the, the only comment, I think I may have made something similar already. Just, I, I believe this is probably um, one of our biggest challenges to this council is facing. And I, I, I appreciate the time and care taken in, in formulating the, uh, the, the, uh, the motion. Thank you. Good. Thank you. And, and thanks to staff who put a lot of work in behind the scenes putting this together to make sure that it met the requirements. So thank you, staff. Uh, other comments or questions from members of council? Good. I just want to, just again, for the sake of the people in, that might be watching, but also um, to review this publicly, I just want to highlight, because um, it's not well known, um, the fourth paragraph, the one that it talks to um, procedural guideline B-1-5 policy 2. <coughs> and it says that uh, water quality which presently doesn't meet provincial water quality objectives shall not be further degraded and all practical measures shall be undertaken. That speaks to Muskrat Lake and binds us as a, uh, as a corporation and this was confirmed in our EA in writing that we are required to do everything possible to not further degrade Muskrat Lake. That is what specifically drove some of the discussion around what's referred to later on as a parallel mechanical system. And that parallel mechanical system is very expensive, not just to build, but to operate. And it's driven by these other constraints. So that's why those constraints are listed there, specific to our situation. Good. And I'm looking to manage your public works. I didn't misspeak in any of that. Oh, that's perfect. Okay, good. Any, does that drive any other comments? Okay, so just before we vote on it, the intent is that after this motion, uh, the finalized version of this motion is, is, uh, is voted on by council, it will be sent to county council with the intent that we're going to try to amend the procedural bylaws, have it presented at the December 12th inaugural meeting that county council has in order that we can have county council's support and resolution available for, count, uh, for Roma. So it's lined up in order to knock over the dominoes in that order. That's good. And CAO, anything else on that? No. Good. With that, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor. And it's carried. Thank you for your patience on that item. <coughs> Good. Next item on the agenda is number 12, correspondence. Uh, no items requiring direction. Three informational items. Uh, and I'll just go through them quickly. The first one is the 2024 Communities in Bloom, Ontario Provincial Edition 
invite. It's available there for council to consider. And if there's any comments, I'll, I'll welcome there at the end. Second item is consultation on the future of natural gas expansion and home heating from Enbridge. I was I received an invite um, to participate in a webinar. I think it's next week on this. If there are other members of council that are interested in learning more about it, I believe it's specific to the expansion of natural gas in the Eganville, Bonisher Valley, Naw area, <coughs> not specific to Whitewater Region. And the third item is a tourism growth program, a new granting program um, that specific to Whitewater Region offers $20,000 um, for festivals such as um, um, Beachburg Fair, Cobden Fair, could be a Canada Day celebration, and there are specific criteria to make application for that grant program. Um, I don't believe municipalities are authorized to apply, but not-for-profits are. We can, okay, so good staff are correct to me, we can apply. So I know that this grant application, I believe it's early January that it's due, and it is, uh, has been already distributed to the known not-for-profits in our community that would um, be hosting some type of event that they could consider for it. Good, those are the three information items on the agenda. I'm just gonna quickly ask staff, is there anything that you wanna add? None, okay. Uh, any questions or comments from members of council on any of the three items that were brought up? Good, none seen. Next item on the agenda is announcements. And uh, we'll start with the Deputy Mayor. Thank you very much, Mayor. I just have one. Uh, we recently had uh, five employees who have received uh, recognition service awards uh, for their uh, uh, continued uh, work with, the, with, the, um, uh, with us. Um, they are John Malcolm, who is a firefighter, was here 15 years. Michael Meadows, uh, now a firefighter, 15 years. Roy Church, 15 years of public works. Debbie McLaughlin and Lori Patterson both uh, uh, work with the libraries, and they both have received their five years. So just want to congratulate them, appreciate them for all they have done and for their continued work with the township and... Uh, that was great. Thank you. Good. Councillor Bell, any announcements? Good. Very loud here. Very loud. Okay, good. <laughs> Councillor Tavard, any announcements? Yes, there's um, Christmas in Cobden Park by the Cobden Rec Association on December 10th. And I want to say congratulations to the Whitewater Snowgoers who received the um, not-for-profit award for the Cobden or for the Warden's Community Service Awards. Good. Just to jump onto that one, the photos are available on the County of Renfrew. If we could, if we could ask staff to borrow that photo and also share it on our website. The snowgoers manage over 250 kilometers of trail amongst three municipalities, Horton, Ars, and Amiston Bromley. And we're recognized, I think they're one of, in the province of Ontario, they have the most amount of trails on private property, as one example. So thank you for bringing that up, Councillor Tabard. Councillor Olmsted. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, extend our condolences to the Gould family who uh, suffered a uh, devastating loss of their family farm on the Queen's Line on uh, Friday, this past Friday night, um, and extend kudos to the Whitewater Region's Fire Department who uh, um, the event interrupted their, their uh, Christmas party, and uh, I think most of them got to eat, but I know a lot of them spent the, the entire night overnight at the scene. And in fact, a few days later, I think by five days later, the scene was still smoldering. So quite a tragic loss. And uh, again, kudos to our fire department for their, their actions. I've heard nothing but great positive feedback from the community about our, our firefighters. Thank you. Thank you for acknowledging that, Councillor Olmsted. Kudos to the fire chief and his team. 
Councillor Moore. Nothing, thank you. I was going to talk about the previous, but thank you for, thank you for sharing. Councillor Trim. Uh, yes, um, the um, County of Renfrew is going through a strategic planning exercise and invited uh, other municipalities for input. And um, Mayor Nicholson asked me to attend on behalf of Council uh, because you had another engagement. I was very happy to do so two Fridays ago in the afternoon. And uh, the input I took are, of course, our priorities. Child care, I talked to them about child care. Um, industry, heavy and light, it's something that we, we, we need in our municipality. Um, and of course, uh, what is developing, but it isn't here yet, just reminded them that it's very important for us to have internet and cell service improved. And so those are the um, th those are the, um, the the topics that I took to the county on behalf of our council, and I was very happy to attend. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good, and thank you so much, Councillor Trim. The uh, the um, as I understand that strategic review included the Community Futures Organization, and uh, a great partner has already facilitated a number of businesses within our community starting up, and they offer uh, low interest loans and other programs and training. So a great partnership that the county has with Community Futures. So thank you attending on, on our behalf. Good, the only announcement that I have, uh, and I'll, um, I'll just show you this uh, document will be available for with the clerk if you're interested. But the ombudsman from Ontario, Ontario's ombudsman has released a report, and there is a chapter specific to municipalities that discusses all of the complaints that they have addressed within municipalities, from closed meetings to access uh, accessing committee meetings or um, task force or work group meetings to uh, integrity commissioner complaints, integrity commissioner invest investigations. So now that uh, we have a year under our belt and have been exposed to some of these types of issues, it may be warrant a read or take a look online just so you can get some perspective on how other townships, towns, cities have, have dealt with uh, ombudsman investigations. I found it interesting, so I'll share it. Clerk will have it. Good, all right, so that concludes announcements. Uh, next item on the agenda is bylaws, but our clerk is recommending. We suspend. Yeah. That we suspend the rules so that we can hear bylaws maybe after the public meeting tonight at uh, after whatever time the public meeting ends at 5.30. Can you just word the specific motion you're looking for somebody to move? That Council of Township Whitewater Region suspend the rules to hear the closed session matters before the bylaws. Good. Moved, moved by Councillor Trim, seconded by Councillor Tabbert. Okay, and this is essentially authorizing us to take item 15, deal with it at 4 p.m., uh, and then come back and do item 14 after the public meeting, the budget public meeting tonight. It's good. If there's no questions, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor? And it's carried. Good. So, clerk, are we taking a recess till four or are we moving straight into closed? I, I agree, yeah. So if you can go Excellent. right into number 15 now. Thank you. So we're skipping to item number 15, which is the closed session. It's a CAO performance appraisal. The recommendation is that the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region move into closed session at 3.31 p.m. as permitted in Section 9 of the Procedural Bylaw with the CAO and Acting Deputy Clerk Bulmer to discuss personal matters about an identifiable individual including municipal or local board employees. Good. A mover and a seconder, please. Moved by Councillor Olmsted, seconded by Councillor Trim. Any comments? Seeing none, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor? It's good, and it's carried. But, uh, we'll pause then and allow the room to clear. And
<laughs> Welcome to the Township Whitewater Region regular council meeting. Uh, we just completed our uh, closed session uh, at, and, uh, at 4 18 p.m. and I'm rising and reporting that we discuss the personal matters about an identifiable individual, the CAO, including, uh, which includes uh, municipal or local board employees. And with that, um, we are going to take a recess and recommence the regular council meeting at 5.30 p.m. Uh, to start in with our public meeting about the 2024 budget proposal. That's good. Well, thank you. That, that ends our, we are on now recess.
And welcome back to the Township of Whitewater Region's regular council meeting for Wednesday, December 6th. We'll call ourselves back to order at 5.30 p.m. And the next item on our agenda is a public meeting. Um, this public meeting is to receive uh, the proposed 2024 budget from our treasurer and then to receive any public input, whether that be virtually, in person, or previously submitted in writing. And with that, I will turn the floor back over to our treasurer. Thank you. Um, the first one we'll be starting off tonight with is the draft building fees. Sorry, I'm gonna interrupt again. Hmm? Just to acknowledge, uh, we have one member of council on Zoom. You won't see him on the screens, but he is in the background listening as well. Thank you. Perfect. So the, we're gonna start off with the draft building fees. Uh, so it's set um, through the Building uh, Code Act to have a separate public meeting for if we're gonna change fees uh, with regards to building permits. Uh, since we are proposing to do that in the 2024 budget, uh, I'll present <coughs> that piece first and uh, potentially if, if council wishes to have the public comments to that section at that point in time, and then I'll do a fulsome piece of the entire budget after that, that if that works. Um, so for the 2024 building fees, uh, I start all our presentations with our mission and vision. Uh, it's the driving factor behind what, how we want to set up the, the budget and the, the, and the direction we want to go in. Um, I just want to note that notices were provided uh, for these public meetings uh, on November 15th. They went on the township website uh, through social media and they were in the current newsletter, uh, which everybody should have received uh, last week sometime and then also uh, through some newsprint. So for the building department, uh, in 2023, the total expenses was 287.1, uh, 100. For 2024, uh, we're projecting 284.5, a total decrease at $2,600. Um, the main portion of that decrease is due to a decrease in wages. Um, that decrease comes from the uh, move of an F of point uh, one or yeah point one three of an FDE from uh, the community development coordinator. So the community development coordinator used to be point three three of an FDE to building, planning, and economic development. With the hire of, with the new hire and for the new year, we're going to switch that to be point two five of an FDE to each department. Uh, so that allocation, even though overall wages inside for the current employees have increased with CP uh, with the CPI the overall expenses have gone down because of the, the move of the FTE. These are the proposed uh, changes to the fees for uh, 2024. So the building permit base rate, we're looking to go from 125 to 200. Um, the residential per square foot to go from 0.69 to 75 cents. It's a six, cents, six cent increase. Uh, residential accessory buildings to go from 0.65 to 0.70. Uh, and commercial, industrial, slash institutional to go from 0.85 to 0.95, 10 cent increase per square foot. Uh, commercial, industrial, uh, institutional accessory, so that's anything that's not the main building, similar to residential with accessory. It go from 0.70 to 0.75, so a 5 cent increase. Agricultural, 0.35 to 4. And then agricultural, residential, patio and deck, uh, pool permits and outdoor uh, solid, f uh, solid fuel burning appliances are to go from 125 to 200. So you'd see a $75 increase on each of those permits. Uh, so additional inspections are to go from $80 to 100, um, similar to uh, whenever a non-issued occupancy permit has occurred. Uh, the occupancy permit, this charge uh, is for whenever the permit has closed and they need to come back to actually issue the, the actual occupancy uh, permit to go from 100 to 200. Um, change use to go from 400 to six. Uh, transfer permit 125 to two, same thing with demolition permit and conditional. Um, tank only septic permit is the only one out of the septic fees that is looking to change and it's gonna go, looking to go from 125 to 200. So, um, I, as well as the fees themselves, the actual method for calculating the fees is looking to change in 2024. Um, so the 2023 base calculation was based on the overall floor area, um, finished floor, and then with one quarter of the actual area of the basement. 
Uh, so example was a two-story home with a basement. You'd be charged two floors of area for the, the two floors above ground and the one quarter of the actual amount that is the, the basement square footage. The basement square footage being actual livable room. Uh, it was noted in, the other, in one of the other uh, meetings that crawl spaces would not count for that. It would be the actual livable area. Um, so then for 2024, it, the proposed is based on the entire building and the area footprint. So it'd be the full fee for the basement. So the same example, a two-story home with a basement would be charged for the two floors above ground and the full amount for the third floor on uh, the basement itself. Uh, so this is just a quick calculation to show how it would affect us. So in 2023, that same 1,000 square foot home, two stories with 1,000 square foot basement and a 1,000 square foot garage would cost 2202 for 2023. For 2024, it would cost 29.50. Uh, very comparable to, well, it was the same actually as Iron Prior, and very comparable to Renfrew and Petawawa. This is the budgeted revenue uh, with those permits. Um, so I've made available a increased rationale, uh, and uh, all of council has it as well, where it breaks out a estimated number of permits for homes and all other categories as to how much revenue, and now that's where it comes to that $210,000, um, based on uh, the average square foot of a home, uh, based on uh, the overall size and the type of building. So uh, we were averaging uh, or expecting 35 homes is what we estimate is based on. And then uh, that was an average of 1,600 square feet. So that's where the, the budget revenue comes from. The budget expenses are all the operating costs, including um, software, wages, um, supplies, truck expense, those things. Those fall in under the budgeted expenses. So the budgeted shortfall, which would be um, subsidized through taxation, is $78,250. Any questions? What happens if you don't get 35? Just uh, we'll hold on. We'll get some questions here in just a moment. Um, I just want to verify: is there anybody online who would like virtually who wants to respond to a question? I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm looking. No, we have nobody online. Perfect. Okay. Uh, those people that are in person, what we'll do is, if you would like to ask a question, I just need you to come up to the mic. Uh, make sure you press the button so it's a green light. Say your name and ask your question. You're welcome to come up if you just, just got to come to the podium. It's just so that anybody online or watching <coughs> a YouTube video later can hear the question. Can we just make sure it's on there? I need his name as well. Good. And just start with your name, please. Uh, Gary from GNS of Cobham here. Uh, what happens this whole thing's based on 35 building permits, which is quite a few for Cobden. So if that doesn't fly, uh, this whole thing is kind of way off course. It, and it's supposed to work at, with 35. But I, I think we're kind of building a, a foundation on, on loose ground the way this is being set up. Maybe I'm wrong. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. Staff, do we want to respond to that? Can we speak to the 30 for the forecast for 35? Sure. Um, so we can't determine how many building permits we're going to get each year. Um, we did get as high as 300 over a pile of years. And uh, la this year, because the interest rates went up, there was a decrease. Uh, so if we don't get, sometimes we don't get maybe 35, but then we get more agricultural or something like that, and it kind of balances out. We're, we're trying to figure out what it's going to be. It's hard to determine. In a, if the interest rates drop down, there'll be more, and it's hard to determine right now. We had to start somewhere. And that was kind of the average we had for the last four or five years. The Perfect. 30, Can you just confirm 35. what we had last year for permits issued? Last year? 2020. I think last year we had over 300, or 300, yes. 
305 it was building permits. And the, this year, and the forecast is? And this year, we have right now exactly, we have two, 235 or 240 right now. <coughs> and just remember that you, even though you have 230 this year, you probably have another 150 from the year before that you're always dealing with. And that, uh, so like, we're probably carrying 400 permits that we go and look at every year for inspections. Is there anything else you wanted to note on that one, Treasurer? So yeah, so just note that uh, as the uh, Chief Building Official noted that we look at it as, as an average. So it's a, everything to do with this is not controlled by the township other than the fees themselves. So when were we try to come up with the actual amount that we're going to use as the base for our rates and our, for our calculations for revenue, uh, it's a historical average. So we tried to go, it looks more like we're coming out of the COVID to a pre-COVID number. So that's whenever we were looking at number of actual residential homes, we used that area going back that time to before the, before the COVID period. To, because COVID was an, a substantial boost and what we're seeing now is it, it should be more back to a normal. It, Perfect, does that trigger any comments or questions, Councilor Olmstead? Yeah, I'm just sorry. And just to clarify, it, that it, uh, you mentioned Cobden. This isn't Cobden. This is all the Whitewater region. So you mentioned the 35. It's it's not just Cobden and Gary. So we're, this is across the entire region. I was quickly trying to ascertain where the 35 came from, and I see it there. Yeah. Okay. Now I will highlight that the uh, the, the comment about risk is warranted. There's always a risk. And do we have a risk, a, a plan to mitigate that risk? Yeah, so what actually happens every year is we put a small amount of money away into reserve. It's what's budgeted. It's, it's small, but it, what it, the idea is that it, on years of fluctuation, that is used to go against any losses that we have. Um, the other side is if we say we have more than the, the number of permits that we're projecting, that money would then go into a reserve that money then would go carry forward and do the exact same thing as what the reserve is doing right now. Is it, it tries to stabilize that, that amount. Uh, per the building code, we're not allowed to make money, like have a profit. Any profit is to go directly back into a reserve. So then that's for future stabilization of, of the actual building fees themselves and the expenses. And last point is just to confirm that we have, we received quarterly reports back from the CBO on the progress to date, including uh, financial reports, projected versus actuals, with enough time to be able to assess that risk as we go through the year. Well, that's correct. Yeah. That's good. I will also note too that uh, every year we have to uh, provide an annual report uh, to council as to how this, how it went. That was, I believe, we did that report in April uh, this year, which showed all permits, which is mostly of the information that, for my rationale, is where that came from, was the actual report from the prior year, uh, which dictates indirect expenses, direct expenses, revenue that has been received in, in that year, and the number of permits. Uh, that's a requirement uh, per the Act that, to come every year. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Gary, for the question. It was good. Okay. Uh, is there another, another question? Yes, please, Mrs. Burns, you can come to the mic, just formally introduce I yourself. Sure you already know who I am. It's for, because it's on YouTube. Okay. Uh, anybody can't hear the comments in the room unless they're mic'd. <coughs> is it on? Uh, it's green? Now it is, yeah. Thank you. Can we go back to the slide where you showed how we are comparing ourselves to Arm Prior? So that's Arm Prior, Renfrew, and Petawawa. Okay, what is the difference in the population between, say, Whitewater and Armprior? Do you know that? Not off the top of my head. No. Does anybody know that? Like, are we smaller? We are smaller than Armprior. So yes. we're smaller than Renfrew, we're smaller than Petawawa. Oh, gosh. Okay. Okay, all right, I'll leave this for, I just wanted to get that answer, please. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for the question. Good, is there any other questions? Sorry, 
You, CV do you want me to yeah, do you want please, me to answer yeah. or not? Um, the reason that we uh, compared ourselves to our Empire Renfrew and Petawawa is that we have the same number of permits as our Empire Renfrew and Petawawa. Actually, more than Renfrew on an annual going basis. So that's why we compared us. We're we've been in the last five or six years the top four in development and building permits in Renfrew County. I appreciate that context. Very valuable. Excellent. Is there another member from the public that would like to pose a question specific to the draft building fees presentation? Good. Is there any additional comments from any of the members of council? Or questions? Councillor Olmsted? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just going through the rationale. Um, is that, I guess that's a typo on 2023 projected, at least on the copy I have, showing the... Uh, Permit fees revenue is 150,000, and then in the presentation showing 275. I assume that's just a typo. No, there is actually uh, for for 2023, we're actually very low in permits, and the revenue will actually be very similar to that. Um, when I was projecting uh, the actual to year end, it looks like we'll be running about a 135,000 dollar loss this year when it was projected originally at 15. Oh, okay, so just to clarify, in the presentation, the budgeted revenue was 275, mm -hmm. and on the projected revenue now, uh, you're looking at 150. So we're looking at about $140,000 difference there. Okay. Yep. Great. Yeah. So next year, the news looks quite considerably better because due to the rates then. Yeah, exactly. Great, thank you. Uh, one other note, there is a Whenever the 2023 number was created, it was kind of still riding on the high of the 2022 number of permits. So it was expected that that would kind of fall through. And since it hasn't, and since the actual, it was originally projected in 2023 when budget came forward to do the full basement amount at that point in time, plus go to what the fees are being recommended now. And it was council's decision to half the fees like go half the step to that full amount, plus do an, a kind of an in-step into building for basement. So whenever that happened, um, it was projected this way as 275 for this total number of properties. But since we've seen a, a large decrease in the over number of properties, we didn't increase the revenues as much as what we could have in 2023. So now we're just kind of less properties, but increasing the revenue to offset the same costs. Okay. Yeah, so just, just looking through the projections, actually the last few years of over 300 and then down to approximately 230 this year. So we've had a 33% decrease in permits issued and what about a 25% decrease in revenues. And costs are roughly, well, slightly gone up. So yeah. Okay, well, yeah, it looks like we're in a better position in 2024 for sure. Okay, thank you. Good, any other questions from council? Good, seeing none, we're gonna move on. Treasurer, next uh, presentation, please. Okay, so now we'll st start right into the 2024 uh, draft budget, the public meeting. So in this uh, presentation, we'll go through the general operating, capital, water, wastewater, and user fees. Uh, so this is the budget schedule. So we've gone through from the fourth, where we where re staff received direction from council for looking for a 1% operating increase and a 4.2% uh, capital. Uh, we went to the uh, first presentation on November 1st, uh, the secondary presentation with any changes on the 22nd, and now we're at the public meeting portion with the proposed uh, passing of the bylaw on December 20th. Uh, again, is the mission and vision for the township. Uh, I, we included the uh, notices for this meeting, uh, like the public budget meeting, uh, in, uh, with the uh, building fees at the same time. Uh, to have, uh, and they went through the township website, social media, and the newsletter, and newsprint. So, how much is a 1% levy increase? So, based on last year's levy, which was $6.772 million, 
uh, it equates to 67,729. How is municipal taxation uh, calculated? So it's the tax levy equals the assessment times the rates. So the rates themselves are uh, dependent on county ratios, um, which go through, uh, which are dictated by the county, and uh, are how we weight our assessment. Residential has a weighting assessment of one, uh, commercial, I believe, has a weighting assessment of 1.4. So those are what's based on the original tax, uh, tax rate of the residential rate. Um, so what, what happens is we take the total amount of assessment uh, for the, from our roll book, which comes from MPAC. We take that, we do a calculation based on the ratios, uh, and then use what we actually need to fund as the township ourselves minus grants uh, to come up with what we actually need to, uh, to come up to generate through our levy. So our, how our levy is calculated. So operating versus capital. So our capital levy is uh, total expenses minus grants minus user fees, transfers reserve equals our levy. Uh, the levy do, the, what the levy covers is capital, which is not covered through grants. So the grants that I'm speaking to are CCBF, OCF, or OCIF, and or reserves. Uh, operating not covered through grants is uh, UMF and uh, Canada Summer Jobs. UMF is a levy stabilization fund. Uh, we've seen a slight decrease in that, in that amount. Uh, I'll speak to that one, uh, shortly in the slides. And uh, CCBF has not been confirmed yet for this year, but OSIF has, and I'll speak to that there shortly. So this is the breakdown of every dollar that's collected. So out of every dollar, 30% of it goes to the county, 15% uh, of it goes to the education. We pay 8% to our policing, and 47% is what the municipality itself actually runs on. Um, for all the services that we provide, that's, that's our, our value of it. Um, this is a more uh, comprehensive breakdown between our actual departments. So you can see the 30 cents for the county, 30 cents for education, 8 cents for police. Public Works has 25, admin gets 5, Fire Department, six. Uh, Parks and Rec is four. Council is two. And then capital in reinvestment itself is five cents. This is, to, to note, this is based off the 2023 levy. Uh, this is a comparison for uh, the residential tax rate. So on the one, one end, you can notice we're right smack dab in the middle um, between uh, other uh, municipalities within the county. Uh, Laurentian Valley to, to Pembroke. All of these assessments uh, include the county and education portion, so that's how we are comparable with Pembroke, who is a single tier municipality. They would only pay the education and their own taxation. So to make us comparable, uh, to have this chart comparable, every municipality is, is at their full tax rate what the actual resident would be taxed. Uh, it's based on uh, $179,000 of assessment, uh, which is our median assessment here in uh, Township Whitewater Region. So the levy increase. So what is projected is a 1% for operating. Uh, there's been no change in that over these presentations. Uh, the main driving factors behind the 1% is the cost of living uh, adjustments, the 2.5, uh, health benefits, which uh, are projected in this year to have, and included in the budget, it went up 15.5%. Uh, inflation pressures, uh, the average June to June was 5.43%. Insurance, which has gone up 7.3%, and our debentures, which is the new debentures we've taken on this year. Um, second payment for Homestead, Jeffrey Lake, and the full payment, which was just passed earlier in this council meeting for Cameron, Earl, and Vera Street. Uh, for the capital side, uh, the levy increase is 4.2%. Uh, so the funding sources are the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund, OSIF. Uh, the Cam Canada Community Building Fund, CCBF, and then taxes, reserves, and reserve funds. So whenever uh, staff dis created the list of actual capital items that felt is the most impertinent to be uh, included in this budget, we looked at the must-have, can't-fail, either the timing is right, it's an annual replacement that just has to happen, or it's strategically important. Treasurer, just if you can go back to that one. Can you just explain a little bit more about those two funding sources that are listed from the province? Sure. They're key to the, the, key to the township, uh, and I think it's, it's important for the public to have a, 
sure. some extra additional context. So uh, the first one, the Interior uh, Community Infrastructure Fund, OSIF, is based off of our uh, current replacement value of assets. So it actually bases back onto our asset management plan, takes the overall value of all of our assets and what it would cost for us to replace them. They base that value on a um, calculation factor that they do the math, math on, and it comes to a certain dollar figure. Uh, that dollar figure is what, they, what the government, the Ontario government pays back to the townships in order to assist them because they realize that municipalities have aging infrastructure, so it's a fund that they pay back. We are limited right now at a 15% increase over our every year for our actual amount, because that's a stipulated amount that's been limited through the, through the uh, Ontario government. Um, so whenever that, that fund goes through, we can use that on core infrastructure assets. So that's our roads, that's uh, water treatment, that's buildings, that certain things like that, that are core infrastructure, we can use it on. Um, it's not a thing that, or amount that can be used for operating expenses. And staff time, I should note, cannot be included in that. If we do work ourselves, we cannot count staff time. If we contract out, we can count the, the cost. So there's a, a, a note there. Uh, Canada Community Building Fund, again, very similar. It's a calculation-based funding. Uh, it's a federal funding. Uh, it's based off of uh, amount of taxation that comes from the, from the gas tax. And it comes through, and it's again for core infrastructure assets. So we traditionally here we've used it for for road reconstruction, um, or um, what is projected in this 2024 budget as a capital in item is a dehumidifier for an arena. It's a core infrastructure asset that we can we can use that because uh, it, it works towards recreation as well. Is that clear? So now we'll look at uh, the transfer to reserves. Um, so every year we've done an administration amount of capital reinvestment. Uh, traditionally it's 1% of the levy and this year is no different. Uh, so in 2023 it was 336,713. This year with a 1% increase it's 404,442. The only difference for this one reserve, which I'll speak to later in the presentation, but that reserve uh, is looking to be redirected this year to fund the new debentures that we are taking on. It, it, the debentures are for capital, so it is still an investment in capital. It's just paying the actual borrowing cost and the principal for that capital. Um, administrational and election, no change, uh, no change to emergency managers. Uh, the building administration, that is what the uh, transfer to reserve that I spoke to earlier in the building fees public meeting where that is the amount we, we push to reserve every year for, for uh, level stabilization for the, that department, as well as for uh, the uh, future purchase of a truck, should, the, should it not be needed for levy stabilization. Um, waste, the difference between the prior meetings and the current meeting is that there's actually been a decrease in that transfer to reserves uh, projected, uh, $12,935, due to the fact that the uh, waste um, funding for, or the recycling funding, uh, apologies, uh, recycling funding has actually been decreased by $14,000 through the government. So they did their final reconciliation for what we were uh, projected to get was, was $210,000 and they came back and said no, uh, once they reconciled all uh, other parties it actually came out to be $196,000. So without affecting the actual levy, uh, we just changed the actual uh, transfer to reserves. That transfer to reserves comes out of, uh, as you notice, its source is user fees. It actually comes out of the curbside pickup. There, every year there is a small amount put towards uh, reserve for work to be done, and it's funded by the curbside collection pickup. And this is no different. It's still, we're getting less funding, and it's still being paid for by the curbside collection, so this is just the difference between the contract amount. Uh, landfill post-closure st will stay the same at $20,000. And the uh, Ottawa River Power Corp, um, the, trend, the, the decrease here, which was noted in the last meeting, uh, is the OR, as the dividends and interest earned, and it's a decrease of $2,000. Uh, the only reason for this decrease is to be more uh, exact to what we've received in 2023. Um, this has no effect on the overall budget because the budget itself, it's an in on a reserve line and it's an out on an expense line. 
uh, because we directly transfer it to reserves. So the revenue comes in, the revenue goes back out. It does not uh, affect that 1%. Next into is salaries and wages. So for 2024, uh, we're looking at a total salaries and wages of $4,187,027. Uh, so the total full-time employees will be 33, uh, casual 11, students 7, fire hours 87.50, to a full FTE of 38.07. Um, the $4,187,000 includes the 2.5% COLA, um, and it also includes the uh, increase of approximately $20,000 due to the 15.6% uh, increase, increase in health benefits that's proposed for 2024 with our current provider. Um, we are in the current uh, process of outsource, like marketing our health plans to look for savings, but at this point it's best to budget for it and then, and then move, move on. And if, should any savings be realized, we will bring a report back to council, uh, maybe if the savings are substantial enough to redirect funds elsewhere within the budget. Before you move on, Treasurer, mm -hmm. just for the sake of the public, can you explain what an FTE is? Sure. And what COLA is? Sure. Um, so an FTE is a full-time equivalent. So uh, everyone sitting at this table has a full-time equivalent of one because they perform the task of a 35-hour week and, uh, and, and their total hours are 1820 for the year. If somebody is a part-time employee, uh, say 20 hours a week, they don't equate to the same 1820 for the year, so that's a percentage of an actual one, uh, one body. So the full-time equivalent becomes uh, a part-time person would be, say, a 0.5. So the, where this number of 38.07 comes from is there's a portion of a person in mathematical terms that's used to be at the municipality. You can have, a, you can have more actual employees than the, than the actual FTE, but the FTE is just how many full-time employees we're paying for. You could have three part-time employees that add up to one full-time person. Uh, COLA is the cost of living allowance. So that is the actual cost to uh, more or less live every day. Since everybody sees inflation go up, that's what that is driven to. Uh, inflation on your groceries, on gas, things like that, and that this cost of living is just to keep up with it. So for 2023, um, what has been projected from June to June as the average uh, CPI increase, so the consumer price index uh, increase, was 5.43%. Uh, so we're doing 2.5. We're, we're cutting it down the middle. So the next chart shows a total of the salaries and wages. Um, so you'll see, uh, if we go down all the way through, the total is $4,121,100. Um, the social services uh, decrease of 100% is just because we're not funding anything this year through uh, the budget for the social services department. Uh, other things may be funded in the future through grants, but at this point in time, there's nothing funded through by the actual township itself. Um, the difference for the increase that you see for landfill uh, of 52.24%, that equates to the increase of the one full-time landfill attendant and an adjustment in the number of part-time staff. Uh, I'll speak to that uh, as well later. Um, the water and wastewater, uh, very small increases to both of those. Uh, majority of the increase is just due to, again, the health benefits side and the uh, Oh, 2.5% COLA increase. The piece to note is that uh, these are not full-time employees that are allocated. This is a portion of the current staff just in order to manage these pieces. That's the environmental superintendent uh, wages. Um, so salaries and wages, uh, I've left this slide in because it was part of our last presentation. Um, as a point of notice to where staff is trying to find cost savings, one of which is through the WSAB Excellence Program uh, and, use, and the use of a consultant to try and lower our WSAB costs. Um, currently, we spend about $100,000 on WSAB every year, and we're looking to, to try and push that, that amount down. Uh, the program works by giving us a credit for every program we complete, 
and uh, up to $32,000 of a decrease. So we're just looking to try and do as much savings as we can um, to get as much money for, like, as much benefit for the taxpayer as possible. Next uh, will be our debentures. So this chart shows uh, all of our current debentures. Um, not included on this list is the new one uh, debenture that just got signed tonight, uh, the bylaw that got passed tonight for Cameron Earl and Vera. Uh, so the total 2023 ending balance is 12,251,494,000. In 2024, we'll have to make an entire payment of 1.268 million, uh, which will leave us with 11,378,131 remaining. Uh, so of note, in 2023, uh, there was only one payment uh, budgeted for the Olmsted Jeffrey Lake Road debenture. Uh, it was a $2.5 million debenture that actually closed this year uh, in June, I believe. And one payment was uh, projected to come out of that, which has, uh, has recently uh, been deducted. Uh, it's a 10 year term. Um, so for 2024, the increase of 151,501 pay the equivalent of one payment had to be in uh, added to the budget. Um, Cameron, Earl, and Vera, uh, as we noted earlier, was a uh, new 10-year term loan for $2.5 million. It's, there, is no payments, uh, there was no payments budgeted in 2023, so it's, we have to increase uh, the budget for the two payments of that uh, for 2024, of which 75% is going to go to roads and 25% to water, uh, since it was a uh, water and roads infrastructure uh, project. Uh, another piece of note is debentures that will be ending in 2024 is our solar panels. Uh, so the payment on that will be 33,426 and our backhoe and Freightliner tandem truck of 40,361. The key point to note is whenever the, uh, we remove debentures from, it actually increases our limit for our borrowing limit. Um, per my earlier uh, uh, report to council, with the new Cameron, Earl, and Vera Street, we are sitting about $980,000 of, of uh, annual repayment room. With these removed, which will affect 2025's year, uh, we'll be looking more at $1.2 million with the, the removal of the payments that year. All right, now we'll move on to general operating. So the structure of this one is, uh, this section is based on the FIR, is the financial information return, uh, which stipulates what categories each area falls under and what subcategories fall under it. Um, so you get general government protective services, transportation, environmental, recreation, cultural, and planning and development. Um, so under, sorry, I'm gonna keep pausing you just yep. because for context. Yep. Who dictates an FIR? So the Why FIR, do we do them? Yep. So the FIR is uh, dictated through the Ontario government. So it, every year, all municipalities have to file an FI, FIR. The pieces of it is, so the financial information return tells them our uh, current status, our debenture amount. So that's actually where our debenture limit comes from. That's the information that comes from there. It gives them statistical data on all the municipalities. Uh, it gives them where our uh, accounts receivable things are to judge, gauge our uh, financial structure. Um, it, it also tells them um, overall revenues generated, grants received. It's a, an all-encompassing funding piece that is done uh, once our final year end is done. Uh, ours this year, I, fi I believe, was filed at the end of May. It's due the end of May. We were, we were just before the deadline. So under the general government, uh, so under that is the council, office of the CAO, finance, Human Resources, Legislative Services, and Information, information Technology. Uh, so Council itself uh, is only seeing a $4,200 increase over 2023. Uh, most of that increase comes from wages. Uh, council is being treated the same way as staff in seeing a 2.5% COLA increase. Uh, the other pieces are insurance and contracted services. Um, one of the committees is uh, the Muskrat Watershed Council, and every year we provide a grant uh, to them. Uh, it was in $2,500 in 2023, and there's no increase noted at this time. Administration and, and admin building. Oh, slide didn't come on. Um, so the 2023, uh, over 2023, we're looking at an increase of 68300 
part of that is you'll notice that we go from a 7.14% uh, FTE in 2023 to a 727 that's the increase of uh, an asset management coordinator to assist us with uh, getting our asset management plan up to date, as well as uh, a small portion of the community development coordinator. Uh, since the originally there was 33% uh, of an FTE pushed to three other departments and nothing to admin, uh, the new 0.25 has been added for that. Uh, so the overall staffing increase uh, has gone to 34,900. Uh, insurance and HR has gone up 13,005. Computer expenses 14.6. Uh, health and safety 10.3. Uh, that health and safety is in part to the actual consultant that we're uh, dictating or pro projecting to hire for to save money on the WSIB. Um, and then advertising goes down five. Admin building uh, is only seeing a very minimal increase of $1,700. Our cleaning contract is up uh, to up $5,200, but our electrical inspection is a decrease of 4,000. So all through the, the um, budget presentation, we'll have each department will have their user fees uh, all, as we go through. Um, so these are the user fee changes. So the overall bylaw is not changing, like the overall encompassing the rest is not changing. The only ones fees that are changing are the ones that will be noted here in the presentation. Uh, so tax water certificates are looking to go from 60 to 65, uh, so a $5 increase. Uh, if they would like a rush certificate where they would like it either same, like same day, um, rather than our stipulated three days to respond, uh, would be a $75. Uh, other municipalities have done a very similar thing, a similar aspect um, for lawyers if they're looking for the rush, rush uh, account. And then a tax accounts uh, statement or re, uh, receipt reprint. Currently there is no charge for it and we're proposing to charge $5. Protection to persons and property. So that encompasses our fire, policing, emergency measures, building, animal control, and bylaw enforcement. Um, so Sorry, just a sec, Treasurer. Hmm? So there's going to be questions taken at the very end of the presentation. That's my point. Um, you're going through a whole lot right now that it's very difficult for the public to be able to ask questions because you're not going to remember everything that happened at the very start of this presentation. At your regular council meeting, you had lots of opportunity for council yeah, members yeah, yeah. to, I'll summarize it. to uh, ask questions. And there wasn't this kind of a space in between them. So that's my point. Like I, I Thank you. And what I'll do is I'll just summarize because she wasn't at the mic, but just a highlight about the um, ability to ask questions as we go along. And at this point, what we've decided to do is to provide the whole presentation. We can go back um, if, if necessary at the end and uh, go through whatever slides people might want to go back and see again. Um, but I think we still have, there's a, there's a number of slides tonight that we have to get through to make sure that we cover everything. So the intent is to go through those slides. That's what I'm trying to do to save some time so we don't have to start all over again. Yeah. I thought it would be better to ask questions as they come up. Noted. So the comment again from the public was just that um, preference would have been to ask questions as we go along. We've decided for the purpose of this evening to do it at the end, but input is noted. So treasurer, please carry on. Um, so the fire uh, seeing an increase of 19,622. Uh, FTE is not changing on the under that side. Wages goes up 10 to uh, 10,200. That again has to do with the 2.5% COLA and uh, health benefits. Uh, dispatch fees up 2,200. Uh, water and ice agreement. So this is an agreement that we entered into with the city of Pembroke um, for their services as a $10,842. Uh, a point of note is that in 2025, that will not be 10,842. The annual operating cost is only 3,000, I believe. Um, the 7,000, the difference, 7,842 is actually just to purchase capital equipment uh, for them to be able to uh, accommodate us this for the, the new period and the implementation of the contract. Uh, and then uniforms, we've actually seen a decrease of 5,000 and motorized equipment decreased 2,500. Uh, policing, which is stipulated by the Ontario government uh, through the OPP, uh, they've given us our, their projection for 2024 
Um, their total invoice will be $1,010,084, uh, a decrease of 4216 And that has been uh, confirmed for 2024. So under the fire and or under the protection services, there's uh, under fire itself is the uh, fees we charge for uh, open air burn permits. Uh, so in 2024, we're pre uh, proposing a $10 fee for that permit. Now that fee itself is an annual charge, um, so it's a one-time charge. The difference in permits is there's a residential permit, which is a small campfire. Uh, an open burn permit is a large, I believe, six by six, uh, but the, the fire chief would know better. Um, and then there's the agricultural burn and, and things like that. And that's the next one down. The special permit at large agriculture burn is to go from 80 to 100, so an increase of $20. Uh, request for property information, which so these are uh, what real estate and lawyers ask for, to go from 60 to $70. Uh, a letter to insurance and or lawyer, same thing. 60 to go from go to 60 to 70 dollars <clears throat> and inspections upon request by the building inspector uh, per the for the fire department per a building inspection so these are commercial buildings it goes from 80 to 100 dollars so this is the building department this was already noted in the uh, building fees public meeting i uh, just wanted to put it in there just because it is part of our actual budget. So you can see the decrease of $2,600, which all comes out of a decrease in wages. Uh, again, these are the actual uh, building permit fee increases that are proposed. Same thing here, this continued on, and our septic permit fees. Uh, the actual calculation for the building permits uh, to go from, instead of calculating based on one quarter of the basement area, to be based on uh, the entire uh, square footage of the entire home, all three floors. Uh, and the comparison. Again, the deficit, 78250 uh, based on the budgeted expenses over budgeted revenue. Um, emergency measures, uh, animal control, and bylaw. So emergency measures uh, is only going up um, or having an increase of $230. That's directly to do with uh, health benefits cost and our uh, COLA increase. That is the only uh, change to that budget line item. Uh, same as animal control and bylaw enforcement. Uh, the only difference bylaw enforcement is just slight increase to contract, which is uh, our contract with uh, MLES, uh, which is the COLA increase of 5.4%. 5, 5 Move on to transportation. So under transportation, it's transportation and roads, streetlights and the airport. So there's an increase uh, proposed for 2024 of 30,500. Um, slight increase in the overall FTE um, due to uh, the decrease of one student, but the add of 0.1 of an asset management coordinator. Um, the wages are increasing by 58,200. Uh, the, diff the reason for that, again, is the 2.5%, the, the COLA amount and the, the 15.6% health benefits. Uh, we're proposing to increase cold mix, uh, which is the asphalt for patching roads, by $5,000, culverts, $5,000, dust control, an increase of $5,000. Uh, the, the savings area, we were able to cut uh, seminars and workshops, uh, signs, signs, contracts, and then salt. The one note with the salt decrease is this year we're not projected to reach the actual maximum that we budgeted for 2023. So what the proposal is, is to um, take the difference between what is budgeted and our actual and move that into a reserve to help with our winter road maintenance in the future. So should we have a uh, trying year or a more difficult year for, for snow removal that has a higher cost, we're, we're able to subsidize that with a reserve that we're carrying forward. Not just it won't just disappear in, into one year and it'll carry on through and kind of le sta le stabilize our levy for that one piece of risk. So it, it's an insurance measure on our on the municipality's part. Um, so the user fees under the uh, public works and transportation side is tile drain road crossing approval. So currently there's a hundred dollar char charge for th that uh, service, and it's proposed to go to 250. And the utility road crossing permit again to go from 100 to 250. 
So every year there is the gravel road program that's done. Um, so this year the total is 6.58 kilometers that's proposed to be done with the budget that has been presented. Um, so the, the affected roads would be Whitewater, or Water, sorry, Waterview Road, which is Snake River Line, the Bird Lake Trail, uh, Service Road, from go from Chanel Road to Balmer Road, Oren Road, uh, Calvin to Garden of Eden, and McCoy Road. Um, the optional road was Broom Road at 2.75 kilometers. So street lights and airport, uh, we're projecting no change in either of those departments. Uh, the airport is a grant that we sup supply to the Pembroke Area Airport Commission every year. Uh, and the street lights are in our hamlets uh, and village of uh, Cobden, uh, Beechburg, and uh, Westmeath, and Forest Falls. Now we go to, on to environmental services. So under environmental services, uh, under that category is wastewater, water, those two categories will be presented at the end of this of the budget presentation uh, as separate pieces. Um, recycling, waste, and landfill will be uh, looked at here. Um, so recycling, uh, so this is actual cost with the recycling program that we admin administer. So our operating expenses are looking to increase uh, $6,875 over 2024, 2023. Sorry, uh, That increase is due to an increase in our contract cost with our collection provider. Uh, same thing with waste of a $3,600 increase. Landfill, the increase uh, shown of $87,500, that is due to the increase of uh, an additional staff, uh, full-time staff at the, at the municipal landfill. Um, it was noted in the uh, landfill report, I believe, on the 18th uh, meeting uh, into the um, benefits of that, uh, having that additional employee. And I've noted a few of them here as to the reasons why the, the landfill staffing is required. Um, re regulatory requirement to cover six days per week. Uh, an increase in site traffic due to the closure of the Ottawa Valley Race Recovery Center to Whitewater residents. Uh, the in increased workload associated with the operation of scales. The requirement to provide sufficient staff coverages during breaks, sick days, annual leave allotment. And the requirement for sufficient man hours to sufficiently cover waste uh, during following public openings. So directly at attached to the contract that I spoke to uh, with the uh, contractor is the user fee changes. Um, so this is the curbside collection charge that is on uh, every resident's tax bill that owns a home. So currently it's at 164. Uh, it's proposed to go to 168, uh, so a $4 increase. No change to the uh, bag limit or the uh, recycling. Uh, this increase is just based on the actual increase in the contract costs. So the user fee changes at the landfill. Um, currently, the minimum charge is $20. The only reason for the $1 increase to $21 is because um, the base rate for the original minimum charge was based on 210 kilo kilograms. Um, whenever you do the math, mathematical back out of that for what our new per ton rate would be, uh, it works out to be uh, 22 or 2160. So by decreasing the actual weight and setting a, a set weight of 200 kilograms, it makes it a round number each time. So it's, it's less weight, but also less dollar figure. Um, so the blue box purchases looking to go up a dollar, uh, a special opening of the site to go up 25 to 125. And then for all of our per ton uh, tipping fees to go up uh, $10 and uh, the uh, mattresses and armchairs to go up $10 as well. And the change for boats is currently we bill by the foot, and we're looking to change that to just the per ton tipping rate. So it just, as soon as it goes over the scale, there's nothing required to actually measure the boat or anything like that. It just it's whatever weight it is and it comes back and goes out. Recreation and cultural services. So this deals with our parks, uh, tourist booth, economic development, uh, the arenas, social services, library, and museum. So for our parks, uh, there's an increase of $41,300 projected for the 2024 budget time. Um, the difference here is that um, while going through ice operations and arenas, we did a reallocation of the amount of salaries that are actually allocated to those facilities. And that has in, uh, equated to a majority of the actual increase to this department. 
all line items have not changed dramatic like all line items haven't changed the main ones that were over the staffing um, with the adding of a community services manager and the changing of the allocation of the parks and rec superintendent so this is our ice operations and facilities uh, i should note that these costs um, are <clears throat> for both ice operations and the operation to keep the lights on heat on in the actual facilities themselves so the per current proposed budget is a decrease of ninety six thousand seven hundred fifty dollars with a transfer to reserve of thirty seven five um, the projected piece is uh, Cobden would be fully operational have an ice facility Westmeath would be operational for half a season January to March because it's in the current ice season that it's in having ice installed and Beechburg would have no operations by the township um, as $40,000 was funded in 2023 for the current ice season that it has. Um, the side is none of these facilities, it's, this is not uh, operating expenses of 488,250 directed only to the Cobden Arena. This is uh, the breakdown as three, about $300,000 to Cobden Arena for oper fully operation, $102,000 to Westmeath, and $66,000 to Beechburg. The idea behind that is it keeps the lights on, the heat in the building, and keeps it fully operational. The only difference is the actual ice is not installed in the, in the facilities. Um, user fees for the uh, ice operations and for the ball diamond under the recreation, uh, these have all been increased by CPI of 5.4%. Uh, that has been the, the direct change. These amounts are comparable to other municipalities. Uh, we compared to all uh, the local uh, municipalities, ran through Pembroke, um, Eganville, uh, even looked out as far as Barry's Bay, and they're, they're all very comparable to the, those rates. So the tour, tourist booth and economic development uh, sees an increase of $150. Uh, that is directly to do with uh, salaries and wages, and then economic development same thing um, the difference here is that originally the 0.33 of an fte was the community development coordinator and now that community development coordinator is being reallocated uh down to 0.25 of an fte so slightly less of uh, of one employee's uh, de dedicated time uh, social services which is our current seniors program that program in 2023 uh, was funded majority through grants um ten thousand dollars was committed through the township, but a majority of it was grants received from county and the provincial and federal governments. So as none of those have been received so far this year, we're, we're dictating the only re revenue for that department is $5,000, which is the remainder of a grant that we received in 2023. It's the holdback amount. And that is the only revenue that's actually being dedicated to that, uh, to that department right this time. And I, I've allocated the operating expenses to be the exact same, so it has no effect overall on the budget. Uh, libraries and museum. So the library, uh, in 2023, the operating expenses was $90,000. We gave, a, or the township provided an operating grant of $80,800. Um, so it's projected to be the exact same operating expenses again for 2024. And the operating grant only sees a slight decrease of $100 due to the increase in insurance costs, uh, which are paid for in kind by the township. Um, museum goes from a total budget of $11,100 with an operating grant of $47.50. And then uh, the operating expenses for 2024 is $11,001, same as 2023. But the operating grant, again, decrease of $600 is due to uh, insurance and uh, wages. So under planning, so under the planning comes planning and drainage. So there's a slight increase under our planning uh, side, um, which is just due to the uh, CPI again and the um, health benefit increase. Uh, that has been the biggest increases or effects to the overall budget uh, for 2024. Um, so contracted services were increasing by $9,000. But wages are decreasing 38.50, and streetscaping is decreasing four. So under the user fees, under planning, uh, there's a one is a housekeeping item, which is there's two uh, different uh, categories for severances currently. 
Severance is where we used to dedicate them, dictate and send them off to the county for delegation. And now that we can com uh, complete them ourselves, it's just to remove that one uh, cost so that it goes from $200 to be actually removed as a line item. Uh, severance cancellation, which is where somebody goes through all the work of creating severance and decides they don't want to do it. Uh, so we create a cancellation certificate and that would just have a charge of $200 just to kind of cover our time for the fact that we've gone, like staff has gone through the point in time of creating the work and then just to get a, it's kind of a cost recovery method. Uh, site plan approvals go up 100, it's from 900 to 1,000. And plan of subdivision condominium to go from 1,400 to 1,500. Drainage. Uh, 2023 was 134,000. 2024 is projected at 62,575. The total decrease, decrease is 71,425. Um, this is due to a decrease in municipal drains. So this was a contract service for CCTV inspection of the municipal drains, which has been completed this year. And uh, a decrease in education as some of the courses have been taken this year uh, for the new hire for our, drain, our superintendent. So, Next slide looks at our operating expenses and our operating revenue. So operating expenses is the total expenses that the township uh, will incur for everything that I've uh, just projected, uh, presented in the budget. The operating revenue is revenue that we receive via, via grants. So that's our uh, umph. that is our user fees and charges. Um, that's what that number comes to. So the balance to be funded by the levy, again, which is a, what is actually funded on, from taxpayers, is six uh, six million five hundred forty two thousand eighteen dollars, uh, based based on last year's total operating levy. That's an increase of one percent. These items were allocated budget change items um, presented to council uh, for their consideration uh, as a way to uh, maintain or increase levels of service in certain areas. Uh, with the total cost uh, that they would affect and the levy effects uh, noted in the far right column. Uh, to to uh, the current standpoint, uh, none of these were accepted yet as of now. Capital and special project budget. Uh, so the funding sources. So I've spoken a little bit in, earlier in the presentation about the uh, OSIF, the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund. Um, so the 2024 allocation has actually been confirmed. Uh, it's 645,900 for 2024. Um, that dollar figure, in prior presentations for 2023 was $562,000. So we've actually seen an increase this year of 15% or $84,000. So again, those eligible projects are capital construction of core infrastructure, uh, renewal re rehabilitation and replacement, and asset management software. Uh, Canada Community Building Fund, as of the time of this presentation, we have not received uh, the confirmation for the 2024 allocation. So it is still being budgeted based off the 2023 allocation of 231,956. Uh, this slide shows our total taxation uh, and capital reinvestment reserve uh, fund genera generation of uh, funds. So total is 987,294 to be generated in 2024 from the tax levy, which is made up of our 2023 levy, which is 4.8%, uh, which equaled 298,392, 284,460, which is proposed as the 4.2% for 2024, and then the capital reinvestment reserve levy uh, portion, which is under our operating, which is 404,442. But as what was noted before, uh, 392,650 of that is to be allocated to the new debt of Olmsted Jeffrey Lake Road and Cameron Street and, Earl, uh, and Vera Crescent. Um, so our other reserves are working capital, development charges, water and wastewater. Um, of note, working capital is normally used in emergency situations. It tends to be the um, the one that the municipality doesn't want to dip into. It's not one we budget to dip into. So this is what the commitment, the continual commitment uh, to 4.2 for capital represents. So you can see in 2023, uh, it was the uh, $298,000, so below the five. In 10 years, uh, it brings us up to uh, $3.4 uh, $3 million, $3.5 million uh, nearly. 
um, which would be fully able, us able to fully fund our assets without the reliance on grants, um, which is something that the municipality should, is striving to and what is projected through the asset management plan. So the capital and special projects. Um, so I identified there were 74 projects um, totaling $12,519,600 in total value. Uh, the breakdown was 14 were building, one was engineering, 18 equipment, four fleet, 10 infrastructure, 15 road projects, two with water and one with wastewater, six studies and six administration. Uh, 44 were considered replacements and 30 were considered new. Um, so staff went through these, these projects and tried to find, uh, based on the can't fail, uh, strategically important or um, the timing is right, were the categories that was looked at by staff. So under environmental services. Sorry, uh, sorry, Treasurer, just mm -hmm. go back to the slide. Mm -hmm. So just to make sure it's clear for people who might be watching, a $12 million value on 74 projects, and what amount of money had we set aside for this year? For, uh, for this year, uh, $1.4 million. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Continue. Mm -hmm. So... We're looking at, for the environmental services side, is recycling containers for events, uh, value of 7,500. Uh, landfill improvements, which is gates, bins, and tarp, uh, which is for cover of material, uh, $60,000. And the snowblower, uh, or snow pusher, has changed, um, about $5,000. These are all to be funded from the waste reserve, which has been building over years uh, due to um, portions set aside, again, from the collection contract. Uh, this is just a breakdown again from that uh, landfill study or landfill report that was presented by the environmental superintendent. Um, so we're looking at uh, $8,000 for blast mats to use an addition alternative cover uh, to reduce the landfill filling rate, uh, fencing and gates of 185 uh, for the installation of fencing around the perimeter of the licensed landfill area, uh, waste bins of 28 thousand dollars so that's two 20 yard bins to be used with the new container convenience de depot area which recently i believe opened um cameras and intercom uh, so that's just of uh, five thousand dollars that's for safety for the landfill attendants and allow them to uh, inspect the containers without actually having to climb up and look in the bins uh, under the general government is computers uh for replacement it costs ten thousand five hundred to be funded by the levy uh, staff tablets so that is to track um, hours uh, to switch to an electronic timekeeping method, uh, as well as uh, work orders and uh, pro other projects. Uh, value of seventeen thousand five hundred to come from the modernization reserve and the asbestos management plan, which is to do with our asset retirement obligations, uh, at a value of fifty thousand dollars to come from the levy. Um, under protective services. Uh, the capital projected or pro, uh, proposed is the fire training site, uh, which is to which is uh, to be placed over by the landfill. There's a, actually a, sw a swath of land that the township owns uh, where it's proposed to be uh, installed. Cost of fifty thousand uh, dollars. Fire PPE, which is bunker year, which is an annual replacement, forty thousand dollars, and the fire tanker, uh, which total cost uh, for 2023 estimate is five hundred fifty thousand dollars. Uh, we're proposing to put an uh, amount of 52671.01 uh, into reserve. Um, prior in 2023, $100,000 has also been put away to reserve for that uh, purchase in 2025. So next under um, recreation and cultural services is the Cobb area dehumidifier. Uh, arena dehumidifier, so that's a uh, building and it's a replacement of uh, $69,000 and that's to be funded through the CCBF funding, uh, the Canada Community Building Fund. And then in transportation services, uh, there, there's the Mineview Salt Shed, $75,000 which comes from levy and a small portion from Roads Reserve, uh, trailer uh, which is 14152 levy and capital reinvestment reserve, uh, a light tr pickup truck, $70,000 from levy, uh, the tandem plow truck, which uh, total value is 377321 However, $100,000 has already been put to reserves in 2023. So we'll be uh, funding the, the remaining 277 in this current, uh, in 2024. 
Uh, rapid road, which is a third surface treatment. Currently, it's a DST road. That's to increase its life. Uh, the cost of that is $280,000 to be funded out of uh, OSIF. Uh, Cole Smith, so it's Queen's Line to Kerr Line, DST, um, $220,000, OSIF and CCBF. Uh, Alva Drive and Whites Beach cul-de-sac, uh, which is capital, $10,000 through OSIF. Uh, Sutherland Road, DST to Gravel. Um, the replacement is $42,000 through OSIF. Hyla Road, um, Beachburg Road to Zion Line, which would be a change of DST to Gravel, uh, $65,000 through OSIF. And then the reserve uh, to fund a future road reconstruction project. This is the one change that has happened on this slide since uh, the last two presentations, it was with the increase of the uh, OSIF funding for 2020, um, 2024, with the confirmation of $84,000 increase, that has been added to that reserve amount. So that prior amount was $108,000 and it's now $192,000. So the, the ideal with the uh, apportionment to reserve is we're allowed to carry OSIF funding forward for five years. Uh, so it, the projected would be to do uh, in 2025 a project like uh, Zion Line, which the project cost on that is $920,000. Uh, Simpson Street, uh, which is a project cost of 750, Hume Street, which is a project cost of 650, Crawford Street, which is a project cost of 1.5 million. So in 2025 would be one, or tw yeah, 2025 would be one of those co projects would be chosen and would use that reserve at that point in time. Um, do you want to do a quick speak to this one, these roads? Just give me a break. Yeah, sorry. <coughs> um, yeah, so the following roads uh, are, are being proposed in the 2024 budget. Um, rapid Road, uh, current surface is uh, double, double surface treatment, or DST. Um, we're in staff are proposing to have a, th a third lift, which will, will extend the life value. Um, the current AAD, uh, sorry, the, the, this current speed limit um, is between 80, so 80 and 50 kilometers uh, per hour, and the length is 8.5. Um, and the total, I apologize, and the AD, AADT, sorry, um, is it, actually 423. Uh, um, the next project, uh, Cole Smith, uh, from Queen's Line to Kerr Line. Um, current uh, uh, Surface is DST, um, and it's been proposing uh, that the town staff will reconstruct the, the base and, 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 and remove the, the current service, and then hire out the actual uh, DST surfacing. Um, with the AADT traffic on this road is 527, with a total length of 2.8 kilometers. Um, Southern Lo uh, Road from Snake River Line to Highway 60, um, current speed limit is 80 kilometers with a DT of 197. Um, there's three houses on Sutherland Road with a total length of 1.35 kilometers. Um, this road has actually been being proposed uh, to, be, to be done by township staff and will remain gravel uh, at the completion of the project. Uh, the last road, sorry, is the Highland Road from Beachburg Road to Zion Line, um, with a total distance of 2.35 kilometers. Um, there is eight houses on the, on the stretch, um, and the current, same as the previous road, its current is DST and being proposed to be gravel in 2024. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the total is the total taxation levy increase is 5.2%. That includes the 1% for operating, uh, which is, speaks to the pressures that we, I spoke to at the start, and then 4.2% for capital, uh, which incorporates our funding sources of the OSIF funding, uh, CCBF funding, taxes, reserves, and reserve funds. So overall, that 5.2%, uh, this is how it shapes up for uh, a property with $100,000 assessment. Uh, it comes to a total increase for the year of $17.12. 
So if you looked at the median uh, single family detached assessment, uh, which is uh, derived from MPAC um, for, the, for the entire township is 179,000. We'd be looking at a lower, lower tier. So our uh, municipal tax would be 1301. So the increase in the municipal tax would be $31. Uh, the note is that this is assuming that the county portion, county rates don't change and that the county portion itself does not change uh, overall. <coughs> Any questions? Thanks, Treasurer. Just to acknowledge, there is a third section on water and wastewater, which mm -hmm. we'll do after we take public input. And I also missed, and I should have asked, um, in the previous presentation under um, or for building draft building fees, uh, were there any um, comments received in writing with respect to that portion of the presentation? There was a comment, but it was just a question, and it was it was it was responded to. Perfect. Good. So we can close off. No, no um, questions are received in writing. So I'll just ask first, is there anyone virtually that would like to make a comment or a question? None. Excellent. So then we'll turn to the public. <coughs> Members of the public, if you'd like to speak, yeah, please come up to the mic. Introduce yourself <coughs> and uh, pose your question. I got a lot of questions. So I have to ask the treasurer to go right back to the beginning where the pie chart was. That's a lot of slides. <coughs> okay, so you are showing... So just, just to acknowledge it, Mrs. Donna Burns. Thank you. Yes, Donna Burns. So you are showing, if I can see this correctly, what percentage is for education so education uh, provides is fifteen percent. Fifteen percent of the of the total. Of the, what we pay in taxes That's for correct. white water goes for education to the school boards. That's correct. What dollar amount does that amount to, roughly? Uh, at this current time, I wouldn't. I couldn't hazard that guess right this second. Okay. Well, I I talked to you. You, Mr. McGonagall. I am. Yes. Well, I remember you sent me a letter mm -hmm. in September saying for 2022, the taxes out of white water was 1 million seven hundred and some odd some million seven hundred and some odd thousand dollars went to the education just out of white water. Is that correct? Does that do you recall that? Uh, I believe I believe that's very that's. I close, yeah. So for 23, it'll probably be a little bit more than that, I would assume. Uh, very similar uh, education rates actually have not changed between 2023 and 2022. So the only change would actually be assessments. So it'd be a very small change. Okay. Now, the education is an issue in Rimford, is an issue all over. That's where our children go to school and we're paying to the school board. So does the municipality have any say? Their job is to, is to protect the safety of the people. Is that correct? So just, just to come back, I just want to clarify. Um, we don't pay the school boards. We pay the Ministry of Education. That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. And, it, and it is diverted to the four, four school boards. Right. But through the Ministry of Education does with that money that we provide, and we are obligated by the province to pay that yeah. allocation. So we're obligated by the, the, the province to pay that. We do pay the individual school boards. It's not directed to the uh, Ministry of Education directly. We pay it directly to the school boards, and that is reported, again, through that financial information return. That's where that other side comes into in, the, in quantifying their actual reporting amount that we pay to those, municipal, or those uh, entities. And what's your question? Sorry, just I, I missed it. I'm concerned about the because the municipalities are collecting that much money from the people. I'm kind of concerned about why we're paying so much money if, number one, there's a lot of children that aren't even going to the schools anymore because they no longer feel safe or the parents don't feel that they're, be, they're safe. It's not a safe environment anymore. So what can the 
township or can the township do anything to protect because their priority should be the protection and the safety of the people that live within their communities, is it not? It's a great question. And the school boards and how they provide that service is dictated by the trustees that are elected separately. We are mandated by the province to collect those funds and provide them to the school boards, but how they use the services that are provided are supervised by the elected trustees that are elected by our public. So okay. not, not a township responsibility. Well, maybe not a township responsibility directly, but indirectly, you have an obligation to speak on behalf of the people when it comes to how this education curriculum is being brought forward into the schools within this county, do you not? We don't. But Why not? Your objection is noted. Why do you not make that a part of your responsibility? And, 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 if you're dedicated, you're elected by the people mm -hmm. to protect their interests. Mm -hmm. So on behalf of the people, should it not even be a moral obligation on yours to at least speak on behalf of them? So we'll take that down as a note. It's not specifically part of the budget tonight, but we have it noted. All right, my next question is going back to your gas tax revenue. That's the Canada, is that the Canada Community community Building Fund, the federal fund? It is. Right. How much in dollars does this township get for that? Can you answer that? Yep. Uh... Thank you. So it was $231,956, which was our 2023 allocation. Sorry, I didn't, I can't write as much, as, I can't write as fast as you speak. Sorry, $231,956. $956, mm -hmm. okay. Now, have, have you got that already? So that is, comes in two, fund, two payments per year, and yes, we have received it. So you've received them for 2023? That's correct. So you get it twice a year, or two payments a two, year? You're correct. Okay. So what, the first half and the last half type thing? Exactly. Okay. What about from the province? How much money, dollar-wise, do you get from the province? So for 2024, uh, we're projecting $645,000. That's through OSIF. $645,000, you project? Mm -hmm. That's accurate, that's for 2024, you're, you know you're gonna get that? That's correct. Okay, so going back to the gas tax revenue, that is strictly for roads, is that correct? Uh, core infrastructure assets. So those would be a recreation facilities. Uh, second. Uh, oh. Yeah, so it's core infrastructure assets. So it's roads, uh, transport, uh, anything that has to do with transportation uh, infrastructure, uh, our recreation facilities. So that um, this year, it's part of it is being funded towards the the humidifier in the Cobden Arena. Um, anything that uh, or building infrastructure, anything that has to do with co the core infrastructure assets for us to provide for the township to provide services to to the residents. Okay, and for the Ontario. Uh, uh, same guidelines. But for the same thing or what? Or is there something different? Nope, the same, same guidelines for them. Is, it's the core infrastructure. So basically, asset. you can put that money to anything you want to. No, so it can't go towards anything. Do they for watch all. you to see where it goes? They do, annual reporting every year. And do you get that one year, one lump sum? Or is that twice, two payments so, a year? Or how does that work? The OSIF is a... Um, uh, divided payment. Uh, this year they did eight payments. They, they stipulate how the payments come. Now, what do you have to do as a council to get this money to, given to you? They don't give it away freely, we know that. So both are calculations, and I did speak to this uh, earlier. The um, OSIF itself is based on the replacement value of our assets. So based on our asset management plan and reporting through st from staff, 
So we take all of our core infrastructure assets that would fall under the category for replacement through uh, OSIF or CCBF. Uh, if I'm speaking just to OSIF, they take that full amount of, of assets, then there is a calculation value that the ministry uh, has calculated. We, it's a multiplication times that rate, and we get that percentage uh, of dollar figure every year. So it, the increase piece is that we're, we're projected to have a certain dollar figure, and they uh, do an increase every year of 15%, um, because we are above the actual limit uh, for what they've set for us. So their, their regulated limit is 15% per year. That's why over 2023, we've seen a 15% increase in CCBF or in OSIF. Okay, I, just need to see you. I, I would expect through you, the treasurer though, is there's other obligations like making sure our asset management plan is up to date, yep. uh, ensuring we're filing our FIRs every year on time, uh, ensuring that we're doing annual reporting to the province on what we spend these OCIF stuff on. So there's, a, there's quite a bit of reporting uh, with respect to that as well. Thanks. Okay, now you also sent, said something. I think this is the way I caught it. Um, as you pay off your debentures, your borrowing limit decreases. Is that right? So you pay off your debt. Then, then you have uh, a, a smaller amount than that you're allowed to borrow. Is that correct? No, it's actually the other way around. As we pay off the debt, we our limit actually increases for the amount we can actually borrow. So, so the, the amount that we're allowed to borrow is based on uh, our FIR, uh, which it comes and looks at minus a certain amount of grants for our total revenue. Um, that at 25% is our limit. So they. Uh, through the uh, ministry, they only want municipalities to borrow 25% of what their actual revenue per year is. So that is our limit for our annual repayment limits. We can't go past that without ministry approval. That uh, rate, as we pay off debentures, uh, our annual repayment goes down, which means our room to take on new debt actually increases. So it, when you're saying the ministry, are you talking about municipal affairs and housing? That's correct. All right. So, Mrs. Burns, I'll, I'll, I'll let you go one more question. I'll just see if there's anybody else. That wants oh, to that's hardly fair when you went through all of that. You'll still have an opportunity to come back to the board. I have the advantage of, um, I was here for your council meeting, and I saw your presentation at that time where you had a lot shorter segments to allow the council to ask questions. Mm -hmm. And you're expecting us to have a photographic memory to remember everything that's been presented to ask these questions. That, that shows me that the, as, as far as your attitude, when you said we decided that we're, uh, we're not going to allow you to ask questions until the end, that tells me you don't really give a damn what the public think. Sorry, but that's, I that's how I feel. Do you have another question? Yeah, I do. See if there's anybody else. Um, I'll ask another one here. In your council meeting, it was mentioned that there were three roads that are going to return to Caravo because there wasn't enough money to continue the maintenance on them. You didn't mention that in this presentation, and I'm, I think the public should know, know that, and I'd like to know which three roads are going to be returned to gravel. If you can just highlight that again in the presentation. Sure, so the, the two road, it's, two, it's only two roads. Uh, so it's Sutherland Road, which is going it goes between the highway and Snake River Line, and Hyla Road, which goes between Beechburg Road and Zion Line. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your last one. Uh, Hyla Road. Highland. Hyla. Where can you tell me again where that is? So uh, it's off Beechburg Road. Uh, it's at the end of Zion Line. Very far end of Zion Line. Um, oh, it's not a very big road. No. We're only, we're only proposing to do turn half of it to gravel. Uh, the main reason, it's not for lack of funding to redo it. Uh, it's for um, the piece where the road itself is in such a state of repair that it needs, uh, needs to be refurbished. And the cost to put coal patch on the road is greater than if it was just to be returned to gravel. Uh, and then at, council can delegate or can decide at a later t point if they decide to turn it back to DST at that point in time once extra construction. Can you tell me what DST means? So DST means uh, double surface treatment. So, uh, <laughs> Is that chip and dip? You got it. Okay. 
Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you, Mrs. Burns. Is there any other members of the public that want to ask a question? Good. If I can just get you to introduce yourself, please, for the audience and shoot. Green, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm Lynn Lington. Um, excellent uh, presentation, Mr. McGonagall. A um, lot of numbers. Uh, I just have a, a, a couple of comments to make or questions. Um, we are working on a piece of property and we're taking out um, a lot of brush and uh, we need to get a, a burn permit. So last year we got, well, the year before and last year, a burn permit and it was a, an agricultural burn permit and it was $80. And I was wondering what the rationale is for such a high price to get a burn permit to burn brush in the middle of a field and um, why it's going up by $20. It, just a question. Treasurer, if you can. Yep. So uh, it was proposed uh, there's the increase uh, through the fire chief for cost recovery. Um, so since these uh, those agriculture burns require the fire department to actually come out and do an inspection, uh, with they haven't actually seen an increase uh, in a period of time. Well, they've seen small increases, but we're trying to come back to that point of uh, mitigation for the fact that it's a user fee for specific people. It's not a um, township-wide piece that all levy should subsidize. Um, $100 was, looked, was viewed as a uh, reasonable compromise for what the actual cost recovery of an actual individual coming out and doing the inspection was. Okay. That, if that. Um, and the other um, comment I want to make is, is on the building permit increase. Um, I'm a little worried about what we're charging our, our children in, in this township. Um, the, the cost is very high now and, and young people are trying to, to build buildings and everything is costing so much. Uh, it's quite a worry. Um, people moving or thinking of coming and building in this area, I think, it's going to become a, a deterrent. And um, I, I, th I think maybe it's somewhat related to the, um, the overrun of the uh, water and sewer situation in Cobden. I think it's another way of, of making money to help pay for that project that was quite an overrun and maybe poorly managed. And I don't think it's unfortunate that the young people now have to pay for that. So whatever happened that that project was so badly managed, um, I think maybe you should try and find some more money from the government if um, it was a, an engineering problem that the uh, engineers made a mistake or the cost of the management was poor or the administration was poor. Um, I don't think it's fair to download that on the people in the township that are trying to to improve their their uh, businesses and need to, to to build. So that's that's just my my comment and I hope that maybe you think about that before you increase the building permits. I think they're quite high enough as it is. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Treasurer, do you want to speak to any of the questions that were asked there? Yeah, I just want to put a point of clarification. The increase in the building fees uh, has no effect on anything except for building related, it, none of which is paying for debts for the sewer treatment plant, any, there's no association. The increase in fees under the building, uh, it, which is stipulated under, under the Ontario Building Code and under the building, uh, Ontario Building Act, is that 
the fees that we charge have to be directly related to providing that service. So those fees, as, as seen um, here, are just to cover the, the deficit that we have between the actual budget expenses and the projected revenue from the from these fees, which is the 32 or 35 homes uh, total number of permits, 250 permits. That's where the, the those fees go to. Good, Councillor Olmsted, did you have a? Yeah. <coughs> um, just with respect to the last question. Um, I probably been the guy pushing back the hardest, maybe, I don't know, on, on the, the fees. But just to give you perspective uh, with respect to um, you know, the cost associated with building and stuff. So if you look at the chart there now, 2024, budget, budgeted revenue, $210,000. Budget expenses, 288. So we're still in a shortfall of all the user fees that we're collecting for, sorry, the, the uh, building fees. We're still subsidizing that department by $78,000. So the average taxpayer is subsidizing building going on in our, in our region. So I'm putting up a new building at the store, whatever. The fees that I, that I pay, you are still subsidizing me putting up my building. So we're still not at revenue neutral, even with the increase in fees. So the, the average taxpayer is still subsidizing the building department of you building a building, me building a building, anybody building a building. So hopefully that that makes sense, that that, that that department, the average taxpayer is still subsidizing that department, even with all the increase in activity we've had, we're still not at a break even point. Does that make sense? We still need a lot more building to happen and hopefully not much more increased fees in order to get that department to, to break even. If that makes sense. Good. Thank you. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you for the question and the comments. Uh, next question, please. Doug Shields. Uh, the water, sewer. Oh, Mr. Shields, we're going to do that full presentation next after this discussion. Okay. So if you want to hold those ones, we can. Okay. It'll be on topic with those. The down. You're hiring an employee. One full-time employee. What's the pay? Sixty thousand, eighty-seven thousand and a half. Is that eighty-seven thousand five hundred increase? Is that for one employee? Treasurer, can you respond on the landfill? Yeah, that, that is uh, approximately the overall cost of the one employee. So hey. one employee at eighty-seven thousand five hundred. Does he work five days a week at the dump? That's correct. Five days a week. That's correct. Okay. So just to be clear, that includes all the overhead costs in that 87.5? Mm -hmm. Yes. So the part two, like, I'm guessing you're trying to determine hourly wage. $42. So it's not actually $42. So what happens is, um, as a municipal employee, there's uh, uh, pieces that are paid by the municipality, which are included in that overall cost. Uh, uh, health benefits, uh, which I've already noted, have gone up 15.5% over last yeah, year. I'm, I'm oh. aware of health benefits. I'm aware yeah. of all that stuff because yeah. I pay it as a business owner too. Mm -hmm. Yep. So there's all those other costs on top of what the original salary is. So you have to remove all those costs before you. Uh, the cost is $42 for that employee an hour. Correct? Yeah, I can't say right this second. If you're doing 875 at 2,080 hours a year, it's 42 bucks an hour. To have an employee at the dump. Overall cost, yes, but the, per, yeah. uh, the employee itself would not be receiving that directly. No, I'm not saying that. Okay. It's costing $42 an hour for that employee. And that's saying he works 40 hours a week. Does he work 35 hours a week? It will be 35. Okay. Thank good. you. Any additional questions? Okay, good. Any other questions from the members of the public? Good, and I'll just ask the treasurer to re receive any written questions or comments relating to this portion of the budget <coughs> presentation. Uh, uh, we did, um, and it has been distributed to council. Good, could you just highlight it for the purpose of the public? 
Uh, sure. So it was a uh, request uh, concerning uh, the operation of one uh, ICE facility um, and why for 2024 we're not looking to continue with the model that has been done uh, for 2023 where it's a community uh, run by volunteers. Um, and the other portion of it was, um, uh, I don't have it right in front of me right the second. Um, seniors. Seniors, that's right. Um, was wondering why we did not budget anything for that specific line item. Um, so the piece to that is, uh, as I noted before, we only budgeted uh, a amount of $10,000 in 2023. The rest was for through grants. At this point in time, there is no grants. So uh, we can look at, if we were to receive a grant, we could look at pushing, uh, applying an amount to the budget at that point in time, but without $10,000 is not enough to actually operate the, the, the program. So without the assistance of those grants, the, the amount is negligible. So at this point in time, it's been removed until such a time that grants are uh, applied for and, and confirmed. Just, just for the sake of if the, um, the person who submitted the, that question online, we, are, we do have some funding for seniors that's being provided through a federal grant through that's, some of our partners. That's correct. It's not flowing through you, so it doesn't show up on our budget. It's on their budget, but the services are being provided here, or we're billing them back. Is that, that's correct? That's correct. Excellent. Uh, now, just before I come back, Mr. Shields, that's okay. Is there any other uh, individuals that haven't had a chance to ask a question? Yeah. Perfect. And then we'll come back to you, Mr. Shields. <coughs> I'm Jim, Jim Budworth. Uh, first off, thank you, Curtis. That was really in-depth and really nice as well to see. Thank you everybody else for helping me with my random amount of projects I help with around Whitewater Region as well. Um, CPI sucks, I'd just like to point out, and that's kind of one of the issues we're dealing with. The question I have, just for, for budgets, looking at 2025, how do we know we've been successful? Right, so what criteria, and, and I don't need to know this off the cuff right now, but what, what would show success for 2025? So if we look back at all our decisions, and it's easy to be retroactive, it's easy to look back and be like, we should have done this, we should have done that. What's going to tell us we rocked it, that things worked? And I don't want the answer right now, just at some point, how do, we, how do we figure that out, right? What criteria? Because I'm finding the big issue is nobody knows what, what we're, we're basing it on, what our success is going to be, and I'm all for it. Right? I work with you guys, multiple different things, and I'm just trying to figure that out. Other than that, thank you very much for your time. Perfect, Treasury noted that. I did. Perfect. And if there's no other members of the public that'd like to ask a question, I'll give the mic back to Mr. Shields. Sorry, the question uh, on the rinks. Were the Beachburg crew notified that they are not going to be opening next year? Did that get done after the last council meeting? Yeah, so we've communicated with, uh, we've, we've organized a meeting for next week with uh, Councillor Bell, uh, the members of the Beachburg Rec Association and the WDRA. So they are cognizant of uh, what's before Council in the present, present time and we're meeting them before the, de the December 20th, which is the uh, proposed adoption date if we, if we proceed with that, that date. So we're meeting with them next week to provide them more details, including the user groups. So it was asked by Council to meet with the user groups to express to them what the impacts are. So we're still working to schedule that, that meeting with the user groups. Thanks. Okay, uh, posting right the same day as the last meeting for an arena manager, recreation manager, parks and recreation. So we're not gonna open two rinks or one rink we're gonna open from January to March. We still going ahead with a, an employee at 90 some thousand to $105,000? 
CAO, maybe you want to speak to that position? Yeah, so um, so the report relating to that position came to Council in, uh, in early or mid-October. Uh, so what that, that position is, is the reintroduction of, uh, of that manager role. Uh, in, this, uh, in this new position, um, they will be providing additional liaison with, uh, with different organizations. So uh, whether that be with the cultural organizations, uh, with the libraries and museums, uh, with our seniors' uh, activities, uh, um, as well as with the recreation ones and, and multiple other ones. So we're, you know, Council's aware and I'm sure the public is, we're in the process of acquiring uh, uh, the former CN line. So again, that's another asset that we're going to acquire and we're going to have to manage. So, um, so yeah, that decision was made uh, in, in early to mid-October. Uh, so that would be the reintroduction of that manager. So for the last uh, probably 16 months, uh, since I've taken over as the role of the CAO, I've been serving as, as I've also been serving as two managers. So, uh, in the last 18 months, we've been able to determine where there's that big gap, and the gap is in is in uh, this position. So, to sort of leave our, lead our recreation and our uh, um, you know our cultural opportunities in our community, and we're going to see change, and and we need somebody to lead that, and and uh, we're trying to recruit somebody to support to support that, and that was approved by council separately. Uh, from this year's budget, so uh, in that in that realm of of services, the parks and rec and and, and arena facilities, we've actually gone down. I think uh, about two or about two or uh, if you have it in front of you, Curtis, but uh, probably about two full time equivalents. So we back in 2022, we were 5.51 back when we had uh, uh, Rob as a CAO and we had four managers. Uh, moving into 2024. With these changes, including the manager, we're at 3.58. So uh, we've seen some some operational savings with that, including the addition of the manager. So uh, I'm hopeful that the manager could lead us into the future of our recreation in our community. Thanks. Okay. Um, the dump. Back to the dump again. Did you purchase, or are you in the process of purchasing a machine at a million dollars for the dump, a packer? Good, thank you. Treasurer, can you speak to the packer? At this point in time, the uh, compactor has been removed from the 2024 budget, uh, as it will, the actual payment for it, uh, if we were to venture it, I would asked, not occur. Are you in the process of purchasing one? At this current point in time, no. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. And thanks for the questions, Mr. Shields. Is there any other questions from the members of the public? Seeing none, what we'll do is we're just going to stop for a quick bio break. So I'll call for a five minute recess. Do you want to see if council has questions? Oh, yeah, sorry, I apologize. That's right. Thanks, clerk. Council, is there any questions as a result of any of the comments or questions you've heard tonight from the members of the public? None, uh, and seeing none online. Good, so we'll take a five minute recess. It's uh, 718 now. We'll recommence about 723, 725 uh, with water and wastewater. Thank you.
And welcome back uh, to the Township Whitewater Region's regular council meeting. Oh, I can get. Uh, welcome back to the Township of Whitewater Region's regular council meeting for the 6th of December. Uh, we'll recommence here at 7:23 p.m. Uh, we are just uh, on the third presentation of our public meeting. Uh, the next um, presentation will be on water and wastewater, and I'll turn it back to the treasurer to take us through the PowerPoint. Thank you very much. Uh, so for water and wastewater, uh, there has been uh, no changes since our last presentation. Um, so the water increase is looking at 8.5%. Uh, the driving factors again for that is the aqua contract and the ventures. Uh, when I speak about debentures, that's uh, due to the uh, Cameron, Earl and Vera Street uh, portion of their debenture for the increase. Uh, wastewater increase is 12.55%. Driving factors behind that is the overall operating costs and debentures again. So this is just a comparison for the rate increase history. Um, it's a comparison between what our original rate uh, study recommended and the actual increase that was uh, implemented by council. So in 2020, uh, under the water rates, the study recommended 20% increase. Uh, the actual increase was 21%. Then in 2021, the rate study recommended 10, the council approved nine. In 2022, it was recommended another 10%. Uh, council uh, decided to go with two. The next year in 2023, uh, our current year, uh, was 10% was recommended when we, uh, to get back on track. We went back to 9.3%. So now in 2024, it's proposed with 8.5%. The original rate study project predicted 10, and then going from 2025 down to, to 2029 was 8%, 5%, 3% work its way back down. Uh, to get back to the same level at the end of the 2029 period, the same duration of the water wastewater study, uh, the, I've calculated those rates between 7.8 to 5.9 uh, on, a, on a incline down. Uh, for water uh, wastewater rates, um, in 2020, it was recommended to go 20%. The actual increase was 20%. In 2021, it was recommended to go 60%. Uh, the actual increase was 30%. Uh, then in 2022, recommended was five, actual was five. And then in 2023, to catch up for the um, unimposed uh, increase in 2021, it was implemented 12%, uh, where the recommended uh, per the study was four. Now in 2024, the proposed is 12.55, and the original, again, was projected at three. However, uh, for this uh, 2024, uh, we're budgeting to have the um, water wastewater study uh, redone. Uh, not for the fact of just to redo the rates themselves, but we need to actually uh, renew that study before we can renew the license for uh, our, tr our plants. Uh, that, that license, I believe, comes due in March of 2025, so it's good to do this, this study early uh, so we can relook at uh, the rates themselves. Because whenever this uh, study was originally implanted, uh, the construction of the actual facility had just, uh, just finished, but it hadn't come into operation yet. So a lot of operating costs were not uh, allocated the same. Uh, the 12.55% proposed for 2024 is a uh, break-even uh, costs to revenue um, budget. So for water units, uh, this is the total number of units uh, that we bill based on. Um, so you can see the difference between 2023 to 2024. We got an additional of seven units. Uh, so everything is uh, based on a weighting factor, based on uh, residential. So residential has a weighting factor of one. Small commercial has a weighting factor of one. Uh, medium commercial would be billed <laughs> one and a half times the residential rate. Uh, high commercial gets billed two times the, uh, high, uh, the residential rate. And then multi-res is 80% of the residential rate. So in 20, uh, for 2024, uh, this is what the 8.5% uh, uh, increase represents. So it takes the residential rate from 1,081.41 to 1,173.33, so an annual change of 91.92. Um, same thing with small commercial. Medium commercial goes from 16.23.24 to 17.61.22, uh, increase of 137.98. 
High commercial goes from 216394 to 234787, an increase of 18393. And multi res goes from 86513 to 93867, an increase of 7354. Uh, there are three metered uh, facilities within the uh, township, and for them, the rate goes from 188 per cubic meter to $2.41, or $2.04, cents, 4.1 cents, an increase of 16 cents uh, per cubic, uh, or cubic meter. So for the water, uh, this is a comparison for between 2023 and 2024. So the total revenue is based on uh, that rate times the total number of units as residential units comes to the 1.338 million dollars uh, the salary uh, which was shown earlier in the presentation of 48,480 the FTE of 0.41 the contract which is the aqua contract our supplier or our uh, administrator of the uh, facility is 508,800 uh, our debt is 210,000 that is the uh, additional uh, portion of, of, of debenture debt uh, incurred because of uh, Cameron Vera and Earl Street uh, reconstruction. Uh, electricity and gas is new for this year uh, to show it separately because originally it was under the contract cost. The municipality uh, and, the, and the manager of Public Works has gone through an extensive uh, 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 re, uh, assessment of the, our actual contract and pulled out things that we as the municipality can administer uh, just to try and find cost savings. So the total for that is 74,004. Um, other, which is our repairs and maintenance capital um, and other items within that category is 286,900 uh, with a transfer to reserve of 209,820. So this is a breakdown of how the uh, aqua ca contract stands, stacks up. Uh, so it's 357,600 of salaries and management fee, uh, 62,500 for chemicals, electricity now is zero, and supplies and equipment at 88,700. Um, so the proposed capital and special projects for that for the water department is carbon filter one refurb engineering, which is a study um, for towards the replacement or renewal of that uh, actual uh, filter. The cost of that study is $35,000. Um, the actual cost to refurb the, the, that um, filter is estimated at $550,000. Uh, new is estimated at $1.9 million. Um, the other, two, other three capital projects are the carbon water distribution um, analyzer, which is 62,250. Uh, Beachburg water distribution CI analyzer at $10,000 and the financial plan and rate study, which I uh, alluded to earlier at $35,000. Moving into wastewater, uh, again, these are the total number of units that we bill based off of. You can see there's an increase of 12.5 units over 2023. Uh, same uh, aspects apply to wastewater as they do to water. So residential and commercial are billed the same. Medium commercial is times or the residential rate times 1.5. High commercial is the residential rate times two. Um, Multi-res is the residential rate times 0.8 for 80%. And then meters is just, it's straight metered. So the wastewater rates, uh, residential is looking to go from 1689.68 to 1901.73. Uh, the annual increase is $212.05. That equates to the 12.55% increase. Um, small commercial, same thing. Medium commercial to go from 25.33.91 to 28.51.92, increase of 3.18.01. Uh, high commercial to go from 33.79.29 to 38.03.39, uh, increase of 4.24.10 for the year. And multi-res 13.52.19 to go to 15.21.89, uh, an annual increase of 169.70. For our metered customers, uh, it would be 4.366 per cubic meter and go to 4.914. Uh, increase of 0.548 per cubic meter. So under the budget line items, uh, this comparison is between 2023-2024. You can see the overall revenue uh, is up to 12.55% at $1,095,200. Uh, salary at $19,400. Uh, FTE does, has a slight increase because there's a, an add of a 0.01 uh, for the asset management coordinator position. 
the contract, which is our aqua. You can see there's a decrease between uh, 2023 to 2024. But again, that's because of the, the diligent work of staff to pull out um, electricity and gas costs uh, and the admin costs that are associated with that for cost savings. So electricity and gas now is 139,100. Debt is three, 318,000. Uh, then the other category is uh, repairs and maintenance and capital and then transfer reserve, uh, which was the cost savings that was found of 12,400. Uh, currently in 2023, there was no transfer to reserve. Um, and and add, add on to the other category is um, sewer line repairs, sewer line flushing, um, areas like that, the, those where the foot falls underneath that other category. So the aqua contract, you can see salaries and management fees, 286,450, chemicals at 81,000, supplies and equipment, 60,350. 60, the, the saving, the, the deduction in the, in the contract is majority due to the electricity cost being removed. So this is what the water and wastewater combined rate would look like. Um, so the residential will go from 2771.09 to 3075.06, uh, 303.97 increase for the annual. Uh, small commercial is the same. Medium would go. Medium commercial would go from 41.57.15 to 46.13.13, uh, increase of 455.98. Uh, high commercial would go from 55.43.23 to 61.51.27, uh, increase of 608.04. And multi-res would go from 22.17.32 to 24.60.56, an increase of 243.24. Uh, meter would go from 6.25 to 6.95, uh, increase of 70 cents. The overall increase. Uh, is project is at 10.97 over last year's calculation. This is uh, estimated effect on a medium uh, single family detached uh, with assessment of $198,000, which is the uh, median assessment in Cobden uh, here in the here in the village. Um, so the municipal tax would would be an increase of $34. Um, if you just had water, it'd be an increase of $125.92. And if you have both water and wastewater, uh, it would be 337.97. These are munis it's municipal tax, water and wastewater only. It does not include the education or the county portion uh, for property taxation. And this was the uh, direction from council um, from information presentation on the water wastewater systems that was presented on October 18th, 2023. Um, council directed the following areas uh, for implementation as next steps. So the issue of letters to the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, AMO, and the Rural Ontario Municipalities Association, ROMA, outlining the affordability challenges related to Whitewater Region's water and wastewater rates. Uh, request a joint meeting with Cheryl Gallant, MP, Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke, John Yakubowski, MPP, Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke, and County of Renfrew Warden, Peter Ema, outlining the affordability challenges relating to Whitewater Region's water and wastewater rates. Uh, issue a request via uh, Cheryl Gallant to request a delegation of the Minister of Infrastructure Canada requesting additional funding to subsidize the total cost of wastewater treatment plant reconstruction. And in, 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 issue a request via MPP John Yakubuski for a joint or individual delegations with the Honourable uh, Kenya Surma, uh, Minister of Infrastructure and Honourable Andrea Kakin of Ministry of Environment, Cons Conservation and Parks. Uh, requesting additional funding to subsidize the total cost of the water wastewater treatment plant uh, reconstruction. And lastly, was to direct staff to provide a report on options relating to efficiencies and or revenue generation, i.e. water meters, uh, septage treatment funding, funding model, and aqua optimization, etc. Are there any questions? Perfect. Thank you, Treasurer. I'll just confirm, is there any questions from any folks online? received none. Perfect. And uh, then next we'll we'll open up to the public Mr. Shields. Okay. Can we go back to the slide of Aqua? The revenue water mm -hmm. water wastewater water to start okay. please. Okay. The other slide, we'll leave it this one, but the other slide, it showed 0.41 FTE. That's somebody from Whitewater Township, correct? That's correct. Okay. 
So the salaries and management for Aqua, 334722 They pay the employees. We don't. That's our money. You give that money to Aqua, correct, for their wages? That's correct. Okay. Do you know how many employees they have? Uh, I'll pass that to the manager of Public Works. Yeah, so under the salary lines, um, there's 3.5 FTE, um, and then the management fee um, includes additional management. Um, it also includes, <coughs> sorry, all their um, uh, like the, their their offices, their um, sorry, their offices. That it all includes like their 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 senior management. They're also their um, uh, um, uh, compliance team also. Offices. Could you explain their offices? So, please? so basically, they're, they're they not in our building. No, sorry, in, in Aqua. So Aqua is a, is a very large crown corporation. So, um, part of their oh, they are crown. They're not private. That, that's correct. Okay. Um, so, so, so their mandate is a, a, a fifteen percent of their of their contract goes towards. Um, like the, their offices, uh, uh, their, their compliance team, for example, um, and also <coughs> um, their, their local uh, um, area manager also. Okay. When there's a break, water break, they go out to do it. Aqua does it. The township employees don't do it, correct? That's correct. Do they get a management fee every break? Is there a fee paid in their contract to Aqua at a 15% fee? So there is a fee at when uh, Aqua does not do the work themselves, they hire it out. And there, and there is a, uh, but does Aqua make a 15% fee on going and doing it? There's an administration fee. Yeah, okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Added cost. We used to do that here, right Joe? We used to have people down at the plants doing this stuff. Anyway, there was one other question. Oh, the contractor, or the, sorry, the engineer that did it, and I'll find out who it is. I think it was J2PG if I'm not mistaken. Anyways, the engineer that did the engineering of this wastewater plant, do they do any more work for Whitewater Region? Number one, were they over budget? Can we offer any context on the wastewater treatment plant? Were they over budget? That's it. So the, I mean, I could ask uh, support from uh, from our manager of public works and you could pull up your presentation, uh, Elaine, if you wish. Uh, there was a, I don't want to be long-winded in my response, but there was a fulsome presentation on uh, when, you know, the, the timeline on which you know, the, 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 the project was designed, when it was tendered, when it was presented to council for award uh, and the like. So uh, it's available to us. Uh, Mr. Okay, I'm asking you if they were over budget. What was budgeted by the council? Were we over budget? Final project. I'll have to As a taxpayer, I'd like to know that. Understandably, and I'll have yeah. to defer to the presentation. I'd have to go back and look at it. I don't have it in front of me at the present time. As I understand it is the, the project was awarded at, uh, at, at around $10 million and the construction cost came in at, at around $10 million. But I'll have to defer to the project, uh, the presentation with the details. So you're telling me they weren't over budget then? Uh, I have to refer to the presentation, okay. sir. Yes. Okay, it, it, well it, I want, I, I'd like that answer. I'd gladly meet with you with yep. respect to that, for sure, yep. for sure. No, yes. you, you can send it to me, please. I will, for sure. Yep, yep. yep. Good question, thank yep. you. Yeah, and that, con that engineer firm, do they do any more work for Whitewater Region? Uh, do you want me to respond, uh, Lane? I think uh, at top of mind, they were uh, utilized uh, in the design of uh, Cameron, Vera, and uh, Earl Street, the, re the rede redevelopment of that, the rehabilitation of that, that project. Uh, so yeah, they've been, uh, they've been hired since, uh, uh, since the wastewater treatment plant uh, project. Uh, to, to do that project. Is, are there any others uh, top of mind, uh, Elaine? Yeah, cur currently um, th there isn't. Okay. okay. Now to the water. Uh, specifically, 
my water, my kids' water. Mr. Nicholson, I approached you six weeks ago, if not two months ago, on brown water out of my tap. Mm -hmm. So I did. You said you'd get back to me. I haven't heard a word. This is very disrespectful to somebody that's paying a service. So it is. And I know what you're going to say, and I, I, you, I don't even know if you addressed it with your staff. They're going to say they were flushing the hydrants. Well, lo and behold, a week later, the same thing. They weren't flushing the hydrants again the next week. And I have pictures on my phone for any council member that wants to see the brown water into my house that I, we can't drink, that we're spending between the three homes here, $200 a month bottled water, plus buying the water coolers, because we will not drink brown water. Good point taken, and, and I do acknowledge you did show me the photo, um, but we will follow back up with you on that. Okay. Good. Is there another question from the member of the public? Yes, Mrs. Burns. Can you tell me the contract we have with Aqua? Is it a yearly contract or a five-year contract? What is the term? Manager Public Works? Yeah, so it's a, a two-year extension, um, which the, the, it's at uh, November 2024. A two-year extension to an existing contract? That is correct. Okay. Does anybody here subscribe to Black Locks Reporter? Okay. Has this municipality ever received a citation? Or no, let me put it this way. Have we ever had sewer spillage into the lake? Manager Public Works. Yeah, so this spring there was, uh, I believe, two overflow events that the, in, the spring, uh, in the spring melt. Did you get a citation for it? Uh, it so it was, uh, if a man may, um, so it was notified to the Spills Action Centre as required by uh, 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 MoReg. But did you get a citation for this? Can you? Uh, okay, all right. Sorry? Let me put it this way. So Aqua would be the one, the contractor, who would have been responsible for that, would they not? So Aqua is our um, operating sorter, uh, I'm sorry for a water and wastewater plants. They're your contractor that you pay them. That's correct. So if you get a citation, who pays it? The municipality or Aqua? So if we if we were I guess if, if we were charged, um, if. Uh, I'm not sure about what, what you mean by citation, but... Fine is a fine. citation. If so you fine. get a fine yeah. for the spillage, it's the contamination of the water. Yep, so, so, so we did notify the, the Ministry of Environment and, also, and, and the Spills Action Centre, and, and no fines were, were issued. You were not granted a fine. Okay. Who would be liable for that fine? Aqua or the municipality? Do you know? Uh, typically, it would be the, the, the uh, um, township would be. The township would be. Okay, may I suggest that you get a copy of the November 29th article of Black Locks Reporter. It's an article that talks about several municipalities in Ontario and Quebec that have been dumping raw sewage into our rivers and our lakes. And several of them have received citations and they still continue to do it. So this is very concerning because this is an unsafe practice to the welfare of the people that are drinking this water. And when you are so concerned about the environmental protection on what private property owners do, yet municipalities seem to get away with this. This is kind of concerning and this is kind of hypocritical, but just for caution, I would recommend you just get that article and read it because the public are learning about it more and more. Thank you. That's perfect. Thank you, Mrs. Burns. Absolutely. Just let me check to see if there's anyone else. First, Mr. Shields, and then we'll let you come up. Is there any other member of the public that'd like to pose a question or comment to council? 
No? Okay, Mr. Shields, please. As a user of the water, I'd like a list of the stuff they're dumping into our water in Cobden. I want to know if they're dumping fluoride, any heavy metals. I'd like a list. Thank you. Noted. Thank you, Mr. Shields. Do we want to make comment? Do you have a comment for that? Yeah, we can definitely provide that. Um, I, I can state that, that uh, within Whitewater Region, there is no flu fluoride added to our, our, uh, our drinking water. I'd like that in the right place. Perfect and noted by the treasurer. Yeah. So if I can just make a make a point of reference. So in my correspondence to Mr. Shields with respect to the presentation that was made in on October 18th, we'll all communicate with uh, Mr. Clarou to get that those details as well. Perfect, thanks. and we'll follow back up on the water complaints. That's correct. Yes, thanks. thank you. Good. Any other members of the public that would wish to pose a question or offer a comment? Good. I'll open it up to council. Then is there any? After hearing some of the input tonight, actually, sorry, before council, I'll just verify from the treasurer. Did we receive anything in writing that uh, you could present to council? Uh, no, we did not. Thank you. Good. So, members of council, uh, yes, Councillor Tavert. Are we allowed to ask the members of public a question to, for clarification? I don't believe so, but you can make a comment based on what you've heard that you'd like to get an answer for at a later time. Okay, um, uh, Mrs. Um, okay, one of the um, people at, mentions a report dated November 29th. What was the name of that report again? I, I was Black trying. Locks. Hmm? Black locks. Black locks. Black locks. Black locks. Locks. Okay. And um, may I ask one more clarification? Um, the brown water, is that happening? Do we know if it's happening in other homes or just these three homes in the town, in, in Cobden? Yeah, so we, we did have, uh, back in the fall, we did have a few incidents between a water main break uh, and we had some uh, fl um, uh, emergency services using uh, one of the fire hydrants that caused uh, issues. Um, my understanding that that Aqua did follow up with, with, with all the complaints, and if there is any residents that have, are are are, are um, still still experiencing uh, brown water, is please uh, uh, contact the the uh, uh, municipal office, and staff will follow up. Thank you. Thank you. Just to follow on to Councillor Tabert's question, if we can just review to see if there is any remaining outstanding complaints that haven't been addressed from Aqua, um, and that can be provided and uh, subsequently to Council via an email. Just an update, and Mr. Shields being the one that we're aware of right now, I'd just like to know if there's any others. Good. Any questions from any other member of Council? Councillor Olmsted. Uh, just a comment with respect to Ms. Burns' last comment um, regarding the I guess what's in this Black Locks report, and it sounds like it's planned spillage into rivers and. Uh, I don't know. If, I don't know if he can. I yeah, please yeah. Actually, I've got it written here to go and go and look at it. I can tell you, one of the reasons why we're at where we're at with the wastewater plant and the cost associated with it is because the performance standards are so high that, that, that we, we've been basically handcuffed to adhere to these extremely high performance standards. You, you can basically drink the water coming out of that plant. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, it's not a six million dollar plant, it's a 12 million or 10 or whatever, I don't even know what the number is anymore. But uh, we've had to adhere to such high, high standards. I think there's only a few of them in Ontario built like this because of this at capacity lake. Um, so I, I'd be shocked if there, if there's any, other than an overflow like what we happened in the spring, I'd be shocked if there's any underperformance standards happening. Thank you. Yes, if you could just address what uh, um, Councillor Olmsted had brought further up. Further to what I was just talking about, if you remember the Walkerton incident, that was in the year 2000, 23 years ago. 
At that time when the employees were, the two employees, they were brothers I believe, were held responsible for their carelessness in the water treatment plant that killed seven people and I think there was over 2,300 or 2,800 other people became ill as a result of the drinking water. But at that time, those two employees were dismissed and went to jail, or at least one of them went to jail for a year or more. So that's, that's, what, that's how the municipalities took the drinking water issues. They were serious. The councillors were serious about the safety of their residents at that time, 23 years ago. Now you say you're up to higher standards. Well, you're contracting a crown agency that clearly is not up to higher standards. Because when you have the contamination of bacteria going into your waters, through this contractor, and yet the municipality is the one that's going to be fined and cited for it. No wonder they keep doing it over and over again. What has that agency got to lose? Their crown agency. I don't know. I'd, I'd be curious to find out if the municipalities that have been cited are actually paying the fines, or is it just noted on paper? But. That's the difference between 2000 and 2023 as far as water safety is concerned. That's how it has gone downhill. You say you're dealing with stricter regulations, but it's gone downhill. Thank you. Thanks, Mrs. Burns. And just to clarify, there's some difference between wastewater standards versus drinking water standards. Both are important, and I think the report that the uh, CAO is going to distribute from the 18th of October council meeting will help amplify which uh, provincial acts and standards apply for each of them. So good point and worth discussing just because of the importance we have, um, not just the importance, the significance of the costs that we have here in the wastewater treatment plant. Good. I'll come back to members of council. Is there any other comments or questions from any member of council? Seeing none. Is there any concluding remarks? If I could just note, uh, just recognizing that council is, as a result of the delegation from uh, from the Cobden resident with respect to the water wastewater rates, I don't want to underestimate the fact that we are aware of the water wastewater rates, and uh, maybe there's not 100 people here tonight, but they were here in September, and we had a fulsome report, and they were here in October. So just for the public that are uh, perhaps watching is that... Um, there's been a lot of conversation in the last couple of months with respect to water and wastewater rates. So just, just don't want to say, underestimate the, 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 the complexities and, and, and the, the importance of this matter by virtue of not having 25 people speak tonight. So just, I'm council's aware of this and just to make the public aware as well. Thanks so much. Good, thank you, CEO. And I'll just highlight again for any of the members of the public that maybe have just signed on for the public meeting. Earlier in our regular council meeting, we did pass a motion specific to water and wastewater rates uh, here in Cobden. And the next steps, the actions that were that we agreed to take, uh, no, the notice of motion from today. Yeah, speaking directly towards uh, involving the county. Good, Treasurer, is there any final notes that you need to make before we move on to the next items? Uh, nope, so the, the final page is the budget schedule, so we've gone through the, the 4th down to the 6th, uh, so the final step is the December 20th um, passing of the actual bylaw uh, for the budget and the user fees, um, pending any um, changes or anything delegated from, from Council. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. And we'll just have a summary of the input from the public that was garnered in writing or orally tonight and make that part of the report for the 20th. Yep. Excellent. Good. And I will move on. Thank you for the, that. Uh, end our public meeting at 757. Thank you. Uh, the last item on our agenda is the bylaws item, paragraph 9, 14, item number 14, 14.1. The recommendation before us is that the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region approve the bylaws listed on the December 6th 2023 agenda and there are seven listed as per the agenda. Can I get a mover and a seconder please? Moved by 
Councillor Tabert, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. Is there any comments, questions from members of Council with respect to these seven bylaws listed in Section 14 of our agenda? Good. Seeing none, I will call for a vote. All those in favour? And the motion is carried. That ends our regular council meeting for today, December 6th. Uh, we will adjourn at 7.58 p.m. Thank you.